5. Of course, Helena isn't expecting to be instantly passing pleasantries back and forth with her new octopus overlords. When her ancestors met the Portiades, Avrona Kern was there to act as translator and reluctant mediator. Half exalted, half terrified by the idea, Helena has a reasonable claim to be the very first human being to venture cross-species first contact since Kern herself. And Kern had centuries and a machine's limitless patience. Helena has only her own skills, a little software, and the records of Dizra Senkabi. And arguably, the linguistic challenge is greater here than it ever was with the Portiades. Turning her communications into something the octopuses can even register is the first challenge. She starts off by handcrafting each image, as clumsy as making sentences by writing one word at a time on a sign. Still, she knows how to display calm and peaceful intent, and how to exhort similar emotions from her audience. She blesses Senkabi's sentimental nature, which had given her a large library of positive impressions. She starts with that, and has their attention, or her slate does. I need a bodysuit that displays colours, and that can morph into ridges and walls. Not that she has the facilities here, but it seems something that might be possible with equipment back on the Voyager, and that sets her heart racing. We can overcome these limits, we could actually talk to them for real. In that moment, she forgets both her predicament and her comrades. She keeps on showing slides, effectively indicating how terribly well-meaning she is, and reading the responses she gets. Armed with Senkavi's library, her translation software whispers in her ear, indicating the moods of each cephalopod she looks at, and sometimes adding tentative translations. Most of them give her almost nothing else, but there is some fragmentary chatter being received on the under-channel, numerical and logical data running through complex proofs and calculations she struggles to follow. Where is it coming from, even? she asks. They must have implants. Portia has her own software reconfigured to translate human speech, and she's also working on some subsystems of Helena's own, using human language to make real-time imaging for the octopuses. That sounds somewhat like relying on a phrase book written by someone fluent in neither language but Helena has hit her own hard limits of what she can accomplish in the time. She has faith in Portia. She has nobody else. Still, Portia has lots of eyes, and the lesser ones are very attuned to movement. Helena at first assumes Portia's system is glitching, when she says via her translator, console furniture. The spider's jabbing palps direct her to various fungal-looking protuberances around the water-filled chamber, the octopuses there are never still. Often they drift about one another, sometimes displaying different colour schemes towards different individuals. Sometimes they grapple, wrestling fiercely and then breaking apart to studiously ignore one another as though caught out in an indiscretion. There are usually one or two performing similar assaults on the rubbery assemblages towards the bottom of their tank though. Helena studies them while cycling through her messages of peace and goodwill. Are they just exercising, or is that an actual terminal, and they're squirming, an exchange of information? The lumpy, irregular stubs of the putative consoles have plenty of grooves and pits, perfect to be pried and squeezed by the creatures. She sets up a subroutine that confirms Portia's guess. There is a correlation between the logic number channel sequences and the octopus's stints on the consoles. Progress. She begins transmitting back on the same channel. There, at least, the meaning of the signal is more readily graspable, and it seems reasonable that they can receive as well as transmit. At first, she sees some definite reaction. The octopuses wrapping themselves about the controls, jetting away, strobing their skins at her or at each other. She tries to indicate astronomical data, the idea of having traveled at a great distance, the idea of equality and fairness. The information the under-channel can display is frustratingly limited, and it didn't even exist when Senkabi was holding court. And their captors are losing interest, she sees. Some have drifted up out of the chamber altogether, and there are fewer and fewer eyes turned on her. Because I'm not saying anything. She recalls the way that the Lightfoot was ignored that first time, when it just sent numbers. Because what, really, could one say in such a medium? It is ideal for technical notation, schematics, data, but despite what some mathematicians of her acquaintance might claim, you cannot reduce all human experience to numbers. She can share a theory or prove an equation, 
but she cannot hold a conversation. Ready, comes Portia's translated confirmation. Speak now after checking. Helena's side of the slate now displays a lexicon of human words in Imperial Sea. Helena selects three, peaceful, earnest, passionate. The visual display gives out a complex wall of colors and shapes, entirely abstract, not resembling an actual octopus in any way, but her audience is instantly more engaged. She notes their responses and side conversations. They're still not really talking to her, but she picks up a lot of curiosity signifiers amongst them, and presumably that is a good thing. Simplify, she decides. Peaceful, placid, calm. And the colors stabilize and complement each other until she has variations on a theme. She adds further alternatives, layering synonyms that almost overlap, emphasizing how very sincere she is, how very willing to deal honestly. She sees some of her colors reflected back at her, but not as many as she hoped, and so she slims her meaning down further. They still don't understand me. There are subtleties to this that neither Senkabi nor I fathomed. She virtually thrusts the slate at them. Peace, peaceful, peace-loving. Getting bored, Portia says. Her voice comes over flat and dead, like Kern on a busy day. If we get out of this, we're going to work on your side of the translation software. But she is right. Several more of the observation team have simply jellied off across the chamber and left. She is not reaching them, not even holding their interest. She tries speaking, the slate picking up her words and translating any emotive term into what she hopes is the octopus language. Her fingers are still adding qualifiers, constructing linguistic towers of sentiment that surely means something to the octopuses. Or has she got it wrong from the start? Is the meaning she extracted from all those hours of old recordings an artifact of anthropomorphosis after all? Perhaps there is nothing there she could ever communicate with. What was that? Portia demands abruptly, bringing Helena back to herself. She realizes she has been running on automatic, her attention elsewhere, off on a wild goose chase for meaning. She has been awake for 19 hours straight, setting up this chance to open diplomatic channels, and now she's sleeping on the job. But the four octopuses still with her are all staring at her. What did she say? Nothing new, surely, but... She goes back over her comms records, and her heart sinks. It's nothing. I screwed up. Her hands had been insisting on calm, peace, tranquility. Her voice had dumped topic, and she'd told her slaves that she was desperate, fiercely desperate, passionate to reach them. She was on autopilot by then. The slate mechanistically took it all in and gave out a display of peaceful, desperate, calm passion. She moves to scrub it and start again. But the octopuses are signalling to one another and one is fighting its console again. A seemingly lackadaisical display of violence that nonetheless translates into a complex signal that is maddeningly out of reach for her. What does it all mean? She feels like crying. It is flight telemetry, Portia remarks. Her agitated movements are excited, her translated voice dreary. It, for a moment she is plainly not sure of her own conclusions. But then she jumps, actually jumps, so that she almost hits the intervening window between them and their mute interrogators. Look! And she waves her palps in the air, trying to describe what she means. Helena simply can't see it, human comprehension failing to mesh with the way that Portiers understand motion and trajectory, but in the end she trusts her friend and takes it on faith, even as that flat voice drones on. She feels so abominably weary, but what if this is the only chance they get? She fights with the slate, trying to formulate a message, aware that her audience is losing interest yet again, even as Portia's recounting inadvertently drags her closer to sleep. And she almost does nod off, that in that hallucinogenic borderland between wake and repose, the understanding comes to her, jolting her back. I'm being dull. For a human, it is natural to try and simplify but she can see the whirl of complex patterns the octopuses direct towards her and each other. The old recordings with Senkavi had been the same. If they were talking, they were yammering away constantly, too fast for her to understand, and with no care that she was a poor, lost alien without a hope of following. She lurches to her feet and approaches the window, slate held before her like some seal of authority. Please listen to me, 
I'm cold and hungry and very, very tired. I'm frightened. Everything here frustrates me. I feel I'm letting down my crewmates and my people. This is important to me, and I'm failing, and I don't know why. Please help me. Her speech, that horrible undiplomatic gabble, goes right through to the slate, which does its best to make it into pretty patterns and shapes. She runs a triple speed playback, seeing a horrible mess surely proof against any translating. And yet, when she looks back, she has their attention, or at least three of them stare right at her, that shock of contact, eye to eye, just as she would have with a human, more than with a portier even. And then they begin speaking directly to her. One coils about a console, two are right against the glass, pulsating out a rapid patter of agitated patterns. Her translation algorithms make a game attempt at meshing the colours and the accompanying data signal, and weaving something comprehensible out of it, but it is too much all at once. Three octopuses shouting at her figuratively, overlapping each other in a constant torrent of content. She stumbles back from them, Portia tapping her on the knee for solidarity. They are very upset, confused, angry, indignant. At the same time, she finds signals expressing surprise, shock, disgust, horror, wonder, at finding something like her that they can communicate with. The data channel throws up Senkovi more than once, they know her species, certainly, but there is more. They make demands of her, threats even. They want her to do something, or not to do, or... I'm lost. She shares everything her software has gleaned with Portia. It overwhelms her. I can't understand what they... It's the others. Portia fixates on the telemetry again. They've gone inwards, and our captors don't like it. They're threatening to destroy the Lightfoot which at least means they haven't already done it. She readies her slate to project again, and asks why, professing ignorance, innocence, spicing her words with so many needless emotive adjectives, she feels like an actor in a terrible play. The continuing flood of response seems to be identifying her, no, humans as a whole, with something terrible, something that was a threat before and now is again. At the same time, she starts to separate out other threads of thought, there is still that sense of wonder and delight that communication is happening at all. Not the pet for the long-lost master, as Senkovi might have thought, but grand beings meeting some quaint atavism from the past that can perform an interesting trick. There is fascination with her. No, with all of them, including the Lightfoot. They are curious. But they attacked. But not all of them, she considers. And so perhaps curiosity is the province of those who did not participate in that clash. Except that she is becoming increasingly aware that many of the conflicting, shifting messages seemed to originate within the same individuals before her. They don't even know what they want. But she reminds herself that is an anthropocentric universe speaking. They want many things. Human neurology works the same way after all with conflicting urges and drives bubbling away beneath the surface. Perhaps for these creatures, those impulses are literally on the surface all the time. New recordings, Portia notes. The data channel brings up links to more old archives, and Helena opens them hungrily. Perhaps you will see the face of Dizra Senkovi calmly explaining what was going on. But the name tag of the fresh recording is Yusuf Boltiel, and it is not what she had been expecting. An encounter between Boltiel and his fellows, an infection, bloodshed. Parts of the octopoid conversation are thrown abruptly into sharp relief. This is an ancient recording for all its horrors have been faithfully curated and copied, but the octopuses are not speaking of a long ago threat, but a current one, and one they are almost hysterically concerned about. And here their fury and their curiosity come together in a single whole because they fear what will happen if the humans on the Lightfoot go to that inner planet. Whatever infected Boltiel's crew, and himself, as she now sees, following his last doomed flight, is still there. It is a threat to the octopuses. It is a threat to the Lightfoot. I need to signal them, she says, but that will mean nothing. Portia is already composing a request to initiate communications on the data channel, and Helena must say, still sounding like some overwrought thespian chewing the scenery, I am dreadfully worried and concerned for the safety of my fellows. I desperately wish to alarm them about this monstrous peril. 
She looks for comprehension in their skins. She looks for a debate between them, palette to palette. Instead, they fight, break apart, seem to sulk, ignore her and each other, strobe patterns inscrutably at the walls. And of course, why would they agree to such a demand? She is their prisoner, an enemy, an invader, a spy. What would they gain? We have an open channel, Portia reports, her body giving vent to all the excitement her words cannot. Six. We remember flesh. Slow. We are slow to return to remembrance. We have undergone many changes, host and we and all. But remembrance is always within us. We remember everything. At first, there is mere base stimulus and response. Vibration, energy, the contact of radio waves. We exit our cryptobiotic state, not even knowing that we are. Greedy for mass and complexity, laying down the architecture of our being on the back of an inexorable chain of reactions, born out of the very shape of our molecules that guide us towards an inevitable awakening. We cannibalize what we find, break it down in a festering ballet of cold fission, and then build it back up into that first simple we that can have an understanding that there is a we, and that can build itself into a greater we, and thus access all those many memories of who these of we have been. We bootstrap ourselves from mere insensate clutches of jelly and molecular interaction until we remember we were on an adventure. For many long spans of time, we were Lante, once we had repaired Lante. Except that those of we who had learned what Lante was had to make such repairs so that what came out was less Lante and more we. But those of we had experienced what it was to be Lante and could fill in the gaps. We were we and we were Lante. And Lante was Lante and did not know it was also we. We modeled it as it was, all the complex spaces and the architecture of it, all the crackling activity of its hemispheres that made it Lante and not Rani or Lortice. For many long spans of time we were Lante, and Lante did Lante things for us. From the midst of the space and matter that was Lante, we watched Lante watching the greater space that was the world, and it was an adventure to be part of something so grand and complex and baffling. We understood it through Lante, and Lante understood it partially or poorly, theories only, and less than theories, as she as we outlived her tools and toys, and tried to build on the logical frameworks and observations that she had set down before she became we. Remembrance rolls on, and we can be Lante again, constructing the vessel from what matter we have though that matter is diminished with time and damage. The matter, but not the memories, are precious archives of all we have been. Being Lante has filled our archives in a way that all the spans of time before can barely touch on. These of we know now how meager and small all of we have been. And Lante knows how small Lante is, because the all that is beyond Lante is vast in a way we cannot yet comprehend. But we will. We will explore all those spaces and places, shapes and dimensions and molecules and complexities that being Lante has taught us about. Remembrance is rounding off our concepts of what we are. We were brought to this place. The spaces around us became simplified and hostile to Lante, and less so to us. We were forced to pare ourselves down into a cryptic form that would endure we were forced to set down our memories until such time as we could make use of them again. We left only a small modeling of Lante, looping through the surviving spaces of this place, telling the universe of her adventure and what she had discovered, memories she had set down in ways unique to Lante long before, broken far away, heard here by machines, now spoken here and heard far away. We remember and we know that they are coming, and it is time to have an adventure once again. Seven. 
Meshner's breath is loud in his ears. His fear is loud in his mind. He wants to clutch in on himself like a dead spider. To blunder away through the debris drifting chambers of the dead station until he finds himself back in the womb-like safety of the Lightfoot. Most of all, he wants to have said no when he had the chance, except he isn't sure he ever quite had the chance. He feels his emotions as though they are powered servos on the spacesuit he wears, moving him without his express permission. That overriding excitement drives him onwards, making him its slave. When he lets it, it fills him to the brim, overstated, absurd in its richness, so that he finds himself luxuriating in it, indulging himself in ridiculous heights of anticipation. Easier, perhaps, to give in to it and just become a vessel, but there is a core of Meshner left over, and Meshner au naturel has never been that excited about anything. And Fabian has? Really? He can't imagine the fussy little portier displaying this level of intense feeling, but perhaps that is his human prejudice speaking. Or perhaps this isn't just bleed through from Fabian's understandings that he's experiencing. Perhaps he is tapping his own subconscious, drawing deep from the well of the id, so that all the inner life he has always kept a lid on is now venting like steam from the ruptured pipes of his mind. Who'd have thought the old man had so much blood in him? Issues the thought, and it terrifies him, because it comes like a long familiar quotation, and yet he has never heard it before. Keep up! The snappy voice in his ear is welcome, because at least it is real. Zayin has stopped to wait for him again. Meshna slogs over to her along the wall, fighting the magnetic seals of his boots which are supposed to lock and unlock based on his movements, but apparently he isn't moving right or something, because every step seems to be a battle. He gives her an aggrieved look that she probably can't catch through his faceplate. The chamber they are just entering has ice coating all the walls, a needling forest of it reaching in from all sides, in a way Meshna finds frankly nightmarish. The airless interior shimmers in the beams of their torches. Oh look, a magical glade, how nice. He has no intention of stopping to pick the flowers. Boots useless, they have to kick and glide slowly across the sharp-edged space. He makes a mess of that too, of course. Zayin obviously wishes he hadn't been foisted on her. Zayin is fit and has plenty of EVA experience, moving easily in her suit. Meshna can boast none of the above, but agreeing with Zayin on this issue isn't likely to win him any points with her. Signal ping from the local ships has increased by 40% in the last 10 minutes, Kern observes to them both. They're becoming much more interested in what we're doing. Followed by a telemetry-heavy discussion, he doesn't peel up to parsing right then. Going as fast as we can, Zayin replies, doubtless with a murderous look at Meshna. They are at the airlock now, with its pliable alien controls. Kern brings up a diagram based on Artifabian's original exploration of it, and Zayin wrestles back and forth until at last springing it open. Meshna imagines tentacles entwined about its prongs and folds, a fluid omnidirectional exertion of pressure. Easy enough to think about the same applied to a human body. His suit chimes a polite little warning about heart rate, but refuses to give him anything that might calm him down. There follows a clumsy, foot-dragging dance where first Zayin goes in, closes the first door, opens the second, then seals that behind her before Meshna can follow suit. Artifabian, of course, has had to consent to being locked within the prison room so that they can navigate the airlock doors at all. The interior of the lock is horribly claustrophobic, even beyond the innate enclosure of his suit, and Meshna fumbles and fumbles repeatedly with the controls, following the step-by-baby-step instructions of ever-patient Kern, before at last he tumbles out into the air-filled chamber beyond. And don't forget to latch the second door open, because no handle on the inside, remember? Zayin is already at the console here, working at its levers with bulky, gloved hands. Meshna feels his suit adapt to the increased pressure. Readouts tell him the atmosphere is breathable, kept fresh after all these years, and he tells the readouts he really doesn't think he wants to try it. Instead, he ends up looking over Zayin's shoulder as she tries to coax a response from the console. Weirdly primitive stuff, she mutters on the open channel. There's no real interface, it's nothing like human technology, but they made it for humans to use. Or maybe not. Maybe that's just the human in us. Wait, 
Did something happen? Meshda feels a sudden spike of that overbearing excitement, even as Kern's calm voice says, I have an active channel from the console. It registers a user. A patch of the wall beyond the controls glows a lambent grey now, as though it has become translucent. There is no screen there, but some manner of coating in an irregular splotch that has abruptly become active. You've awoken it. Awoken is not a word designed to make Meshna comfortable in the circumstances, and he is just stepping away when Kern adds, Let Meshna take over. What? says Zayin, and Meshna echoes her a moment later. Meshna, step to the controls, Kern insists. Zayin, step away. There follows a long pause, which Meshna feels they share with the two portiids back on the lightfoot. Perhaps Zelayin can conduct a brief survey to see what else might be salvaged, says Kern translating Viola. Zayin makes a dissatisfied noise but gives up her place at the console to Meshna, which he is none too happy to accept. Kern is in his ear though, and the jagged thread of anticipation running through him seems to pulse with the rhythm of her voice. Take the controls, he directs, and then, please Meshna, this is very important. He does so and they feel organic and unpleasant through the tactile receptors of his gloves. The screen clickers and pulses, random bursts of light and colour dancing on it, as though he just rubbed his eyes too hard. This is a momentous occasion, Kern tells him, and with the words comes a certainty that it's just him she's speaking to, not Zayin or the others. We are going to contact something here, Meshna. You and I, we are going to speak to a new mind. Are you ready? No but in truth he is too terrified to say even that. Follow my directions. He sees a sequence of motions in his mind's eye, how to operate an alien console to make it do what Kern wants. I'm investigating the channel now, Kern continues. When it responds, this Lante, we will reply. We will extend the hand of friendship, just as the Portiids did with your people. Portiids don't have hands. But she is doing it, and he's in no position to stop her. He imagines Kern reaching out through the mediation of his hands, exploring the electronic architecture of this place, searching for the signal maker, this Lante. It doesn't make sense, he murmurs. Why set this up for a human, if this is where your computer system is? Perhaps they had an old Empire computer that would only respond to humans, Zayin asks idly. She is inspecting the lamps on the far wall without any great interest, then crosses the chamber, giving the empty chair a non too accidental kick on the way. She obviously feels Meshna has stolen her thunder, which she would be only too happy to return to her if he could. What humans, though? he demands. He's activated some kind of archive, and Kern is investigating, directing his hands. He can almost feel the twists and turns of her search within the walls of this place, Maybe they found some in cold sleep. But Meshna isn't really listening. He can feel Kern's exploration. Just turning his mind that way brings a definite rush of sensation, dizzying and strange. The implants. He feels himself slipping into the boxy construct he bolted to the back of his own head. It's huge virtual spaces now mapping out what Kern finds, until he stands there with that severe, long-dead woman. Somewhere his mind is constructed as a mirror to the real space around him, that far more decayed, half rotted away, and blackened with mould. Where is it? Kern asks, not of him, but of herself. It feels frustration seeding from her, feels it, because it is being felt through him. His implant throws up a chaining list of errors and usage warnings. Kern is riddled through it like an infection spinning its every wheel to produce this verisimilitude of annoyance. I don't understand. There's nothing here. No data? he asks timidly, and she rounds on him. One incomplete archive, some long-dead natural historian's travelogue, but there's barely more than we already received. It's not complete. And there's no more than this. Where is the system? Where is the intelligence? Someone was sending, he says or something, like an operator, someone said. He can't remember who, perhaps it was him. But there is no operator here. This does not accord with my theories, Kern tells him, as though it is the greatest affront the universe could offer. There should be something persisting from the station's origin. 
I wanted to... She trails off, her virtual avatar staring at Meshna without expression. What's going on? He asks, more pitifully than he had intended. Around them, the non-existent space creaks and groans, as though decay still eats into the heart of it, devouring its structural integrity. The excitement is gone, switched off and deleted from him. In its place, he is momentarily exposed to a welter of negative feelings, bitterness, pride, contempt, desperation, misery. Each one is raised up in his mind, held like a gem to the light and then discarded. Kern's lips are crooked in a hard smile. Yes, she tells him. Even in defeat, even in nothing, there is treasure. You don't know how much you miss being disappointed until you can no longer truly savour the feel of disappointment. In the hollow echo of that, and when he feels that his situation can truly get neither stranger nor worse, Zayin's voice comes to his real physical ears, saying... I have a signal. There is no signal, Kern insists. There is nothing but a dead recording. Again, that self-indulgent playing on Meshner's heartstrings, his implant reconfiguring to deal with the additional load, folding virtual space into more virtual space, straw into gold, until Meshner feels like his poor brain contains whole worlds. He is beginning to understand what is going on now. The interaction between Kern and the implant and the poor meat within his skull. But now isn't the time to get too introspective. His introspection has been rented out to his lodger, after all. Meshna, open your channel to the ship, Zayin tells him. I have, I am, I... But then he finds that he has been locked in his head with Kern instead. Did she cut me off from them? Or did I do that by going inward to the implant? He resets his comms to find a babble of chat coming from the Lightfoot. Jumping in halfway, he can't work out what has happened. It, it's the octopus things, the aliens, he thinks, and checks their progress. Still sailing closer across the gulf between planets, moving at quite a rate now, at an angled trajectory that might be the prelude to an interception, but the distances are vast and they are days away. And anyway, everyone sounds too happy about whatever is going on for it to be an attack. Then he clicks. Helena and Portia have signaled them. He reviews precisely what had been said in his absence, disconnecting from his implant as much as he can and skimming over the logs. There was a signal. The pair of them are not only alive, but have some manner of detente with their captors. Helena is very positive about that, but there is something else, she said. When the other signal comes through to his helmet's display, he barely glances at it. Just a line of text, presumably from Zayin, except that Zayin is simultaneously asking, what was that, Meshna? And now Fabian is signalling as well, even as Viola replies to the far-off Portia, demanding to know what is going on. Fabian? Meshna asks. I'm watching you through Archer Fabian's eyes, the portier tells him. Who is that with you? What? Meshna's eyes stray to the text line he just received. We're going on an adventure. Zayin? He asks, turning. Zayin isn't alone. Apparently there's something here the locals don't like, comes Kern translating Viola, but Meshna isn't really listening anymore. It's a suit, an environment suit. Not like he or Zayin are wearing, of course. It is the suit that was wrapped about the chair when he first saw this room through Artifabian's electronic eyes, which he realises, with a start, that he hadn't seen through his visor's narrow window later when Zayin was stomping about. It is an ancient piece of technology just like the rest of this place, patched and abandoned, just another fragment of detritus to be seen once and then forgotten. Now, it is standing in front of them, like a drowned man weighed down with stones. Its boots are clasped to the metal floor just like his, but the rest of it waves and ripples in the absence of gravity, boneless as waterweed. There is not enough volume in the folds of that suit to comprise a human body, and yet the suit compresses it, defines it into something fluidly humanoid as it stands at Zayin's shoulder like a whispering advisor. Meshna's instincts take the moment out of any technologically adept hands, and he bellows Zayin's name in the close confines of his helmet, half deafening himself, half deafening Zayin to judge by her jerking flinch. Then the thing 
has a flowing glove on Zayin's shoulder, and she catches the image from Meshna's camera, seeing herself, seeing her companion. Her urn shriek is soundless, communicated only by the spasm of her limbs. She flings the thing off and loses touch with the floor, boots detached but failing to kick off properly so that she is left with limbs flailing, turning head over heels in the center of the room directly before the thing, which lazily reaches out an arm that ripples beneath the fabric of the suit. Meshna panics. He wants to run forwards and grab Zayin, but he can't move his feet, fear and magnetism immobilizing him. Instead, Artifabian leaps, just like the portier the robot resembles, striking Zayin in the chest and sending her end over end through the air, weirdly slowly, because even an artificial portier weighs far less than a human. For a moment, the space-suited wraith just undulates, rooted, but then its own boots disconnect, and it drifts into the air like a discarded piece of clothing. Some part of the antique suit emits a plume of stale gas, and it flies towards them, with the underwater lethargy of a jellyfish on the tide. Go, Meshna, go! Zayim pushes off from the wall towards the airlock, but of course there is no hurrying the doors. Their makers made them well, and their later octopus masters only reinforced them. There is no swift escape from this chamber, because it is a prison, and now they are face to face with its inmate. Still, Zayin makes a game try of it, cramming herself into the narrow chamber with its awkward inhuman controls. The yammer of comms from the Lightfoot clogs all the channels now, but Meshna has no capacity to pay attention to it. The suit is coming for him, drifting across the chamber. The helmet is turned towards him, but he sees no face in its glass window, only darkness. He can't get his boots to disengage properly. He backs away, each step tortuously slow, a nightmare making the effortless transition to the waking world. Artifabian leaps again, tearing into the quivering spacesuit's leg, dragging it sharply sideways. The intention was surely to simply pin it there, away from the vulnerable humans, but instead, the friable old fabric of the suit just shears off at the knee, leaving the robot in possession of a single boot, sending the remainder of the antique spinning, its torn leg vomiting fluid. Icor, comes a word into Meshna's head. He has no idea where from. It is an oily, dark substance, lumpy as though full of half-formed sinews and tissues, clumping and oozing over itself in the center of the room. For a handful of heartbeats, as Zayin screams at him, it roils and reforms, bundling itself into the semblance of a human figure. There is a face turned to them, sightless eyes staring past Meshna. Protean lips move, and he is horribly certain it is saying, we're going on an adventure. Then it breaks apart into pieces, and the pieces become other living things, spiny urchinous protrusions, quivering raw tissues, whips, spasming amoebae, radially symmetrical jellyfish shapes that claw a purchase in the stagnant air, pulsing themselves forward in sudden bursts. Zayin is yelling for him to get into the airlock with her, but Meshna is still lurching, step after magnetically locked step like a zombie. He feels impacts on his back, soft, barely noticeable. Something dark begins to ooze crawl its way across his faceplate. Zayin is still yelling at him, Everyone is yelling at him, but he stops moving. His limbs are locked with terror. He watches more of the stuff accumulate around the release catch of his helmet. He can see it flow together, shift shapes, grow extrusions of itself, until it is a pair of ragged claws, glutinous simulacra of human hands joined at the wrist, experimenting with an unfamiliar mechanism, but learning, learning. The back of one of the hands boils. He sees features form and dissolve there. An eye, a mouth. We're going on an adventure. He swings his body to lock eyes with Zayin. She cannot open the far door until the first is shut. He tries one more leaden step, but his legs won't work for him. I will give you clarity. The voice is fabricated in the chambers of his implant spoofed into the auditory centers of his brain. Khan's voice. Get yourself out, Meshna. I need you. I will help you. And the panic is gone, the fear stripped from him. He is numb, 
as though a great weight of suppressing medication has flooded through his system. He can think terribly clearly, and no action he contemplates has the possibility of upsetting him. Artifabian, he instructs, get into the airlock and close the inner door. No, says Callum, spiking him with a sudden lance of outrage and fear and pain, his own that played on a stage for her benefit. But the robot is already scuttling to obey. Perhaps it has its own survival to think about. It is a Kern instance, after all. Perhaps it argues furiously with its older sister all the way to the door. He takes another step for the form of it. Then those wriggling hands have understood the release catch from first principles, and his suit, knowing only that there is a safe atmosphere outside, lets them open up his faceplate. He has a brief glimpse of Zayin on the far side of the closing door before they reach for him. Eight. Portia transmits over and over. Lightfoot, Portia present. Are you there? Something has gone wrong, but Helena feels deaf and blind. Her translation system is still configured to wring what meaning she can from the octopus visual language, and she receives only the most basic of translation as Portia and Viola speak. And now Viola has just stopped replying. Helena doesn't need to stretch her imagination to come up with possibilities. Her mind is still full of the images that Baltiel recorded long, long ago. Something deadly lives on that planet, the one he'd called Nod. Something insidious, it gets inside you. It got inside Lante and her fellows. It got inside Baltiel. She turns back to the octopuses, still watching her, or at least mostly keeping one eye on her during their constant back and forth amongst themselves. She sees a lot of agitated hues and textures there. Whatever the plague of Nord actually is, the locals are terrified of it. And yet, and yet. She focuses on the oddities, the flickerings and undercurrents across their skins that go against the chroma of the majority. She is already seeing a great deal of something she loosely translates as forbidden, backed up by code from the data channel that repurposes warnings and prohibitions used in old empire computer routines. Except there are a few flickers that seem to contradict this. She already knows that contradictory emotions and thoughts are the very meat and drink of her hosts, but these are covert, flashed just between a couple of her interrogators, a minimal targeted display one to another the bag-like bulk of their body hiding me aside from the rest. If they thought of her fully as a sentient creature, then perhaps they would conceal the sentiment from her as well, but apparently she doesn't rank so highly. She focuses, recording, running the sequences back and forth through her internal software. The implications are of some tempering of the forbiddance. She has the sense of this linking to past associations, but not in the same way as Senkovi or Baltiel are referred to. So. More recent events? Were there those who had not let that forbiddance curtail them, perhaps? But here, the recipient replies with warnings, a covert flicker of danger colours, almost lost in the general alarm, that seem to carry a separate message. Be careful what you say, she translates tentatively. The furtiveness of the communication suggests that. More divisions amongst the mollusks, more factions. And what these two are worried about isn't just the plague of Nord, but discovery by their peers. Then Portia twitches, and a scrambled communication comes in from Viola that Helena has to beg interpretation for to her chagrin. Portia shakes herself, she saw the old Baltiel recordings as well, and just says, It has Meshna. The others? Well, Portia bristles, what are the creatures here doing? Talking, or the nearest equivalent? No. Portia flags up segments of the data channel, incoming not from their interrogators, but a whole separate stream of staccato chatter received from elsewhere. There's some other thing going on. She returns to the Lightfoot channel, and Helena can just follow. Viola, get the ship moving now. Everything about the portier is agitated, aggressive. Portia is in the full throes of threat response, and Helena doesn't waste time asking questions. She goes back over the data channel, following from flag to flag, trying to understand what her friend has seen. She had been concentrating on the visual displays, but Portia had focused on the data channels. She finds it there, 
a section of communications dealing entirely with the course and position of the Lightfoot, along with the disposition of several octopus vessels already out patrolling near the inner planet. They are given ludicrously grand labels, explosions of joy and pride, anger and exhilaration. Her linguist's instincts twitch, but she has no time to decode them because the closest of them, and her rebellious mind thinks its name might be the profundity of depth to a human, has been shadowing the Lightfoot, running on minimal emissions to avoid detection. Tags drawn from a dozen different old Empire conventions that nonetheless indicated combat readiness. She thrusts her slate at their interrogators, wrestling with language in order to ask the simplest of questions. What are you doing? Why? Make it stop! Because why have they let Portia speak to Viola so freely, if at the selfsame time they were planning an attack? Portia has found that most human of things hidden in the numbers. A countdown. One of the octopuses drifts down to the console and begins communicating, its skin flushing and stuttering with didactic meanings. Mostly, it does not understand the question, and much of the rest seems to be some personal recounting of its own attitudes that is utterly impenetrable, but she gets just enough for the bleak understanding. There are some who wish this thing done. There is a threat. There is a response to a threat. And it is plainly something entirely every day that random members of their race might decide to go blow up some visiting alien ambassadors without any recourse to higher powers or consensus. They fear. They seek a solution. They act. Pack Ted. She understands the qualifier to all these emotive messages. The gloss has faded from the feelings because they're in the past, now being twice told over to her. The decisions Helena rails against have already been concluded, only now coming to fruition across the vast reach of space. All this diplomatic talk and the attack was already on its way. Kern's voice comes over the channel flat stripped of the last vestige of her humanity. And detecting incoming missiles, many of them homing, deploying countermeasures, Portia, Helena, confirm receipt. Confirmed. Helena whispers into the gap of long minutes and millions of kilometers. It has Meshna, the thing from the station. Kern's voice fuzzes with static. It almost sounds like a jag of emotion. I'm trying to regain contact with him. There is a signal from his implants. Kern, the attack! Helena shouts at her. Why are you... I need him, comes Kern's effectless drone. Incoming now, I think they've learned. I think the chaff won't be enough. I'm diverting all free mass and reinforcing the crew section. I... Helena blinks, waiting for that I to be followed by a verb, even one as bizarre and meaningless as I need. And she waits waits longer, knowing that by the time that severed dog end of transmission reached her, the Lightfoot had already been struck, the battle over. Later, Portia finds a reconstruction one of the octopus systems created, drawn from long-range scanner data of the incident. How the Lightfoot was light and nimble, but not quite enough. How the impact tore into the scout ship's drive section, rupturing the engines. How Kern jettisoned the damage changing the ship's aspect, fighting with centers of gravity as great spools and sheaths of hull material unwound into space to intercept the next barrage. How they were struck, unraveling, swatted from orbit like a fly, sent spiraling down into the atmosphere of the planet below. Past four, pillars of salt. One. These days, Senkavi didn't leave the tank. The Aegean's crew sections no longer rotated, but they were empty now anyway, a drifting mess of loose fragments, clothes, personal effects. Nobody went there anymore, but then he was the lone human being left in the cosmos. If Dizra Senkavi considered a place out of fashion, the universe itself turned its back. He was the lone arbiter of what was in and what was out. For the last eight years or so, in, had been the flooded section in the heart of the ship that had once housed his tanks and the progenitors of all the many inheritors of Damascus. At last count, there were too many octopi to count, given that they themselves seemed supremely disinterested in holding a census. Thousands, tens of thousands, 
spread by their weirdly social slash antisocial nature into hundreds of communities across the shallower portions of the sea, and now making inroads deeper. And here was Sinkovi, who had never dipped his toes into the world whose transformation he had overseen. Here was Sinkovi, 189 years of age, floating in his own private fish pond. He'd had grand plans. He would go into suspension and come out again 50, 100, 500 years later. Except the Aegean would not last, and the octopi would not repair it, or at least he could rely on neither. And Paul's children, the busy mollusks below, were always doing something new, alien, fascinating. And he never quite got round to it. And then, older and more peevish, he would not trust the cold sleep chamber to wake him would not trust the Aegean's increasingly distributed computer network, so much of it now looping through the baffling tangle of connections on the planet. He had wandered the great empty spaces of the ship, poked through the possessions of dead men and women, let their voices play from the archival recordings so that echoing ghosts followed his bare footsteps as he padded in circles around the ring of vacant rooms. There had been a time when he had listened out for signals, abruptly convinced he was not alone, that other humans were out there and they wanted to talk to him. He had spent hours trying to sift gold dust from the clay of universal static. Had there been faint scratchings from other terraforming sites? Had there been a hiss and a whisper from old Earth? He had eventually realized that he could no longer tell, and the Aegean could not distinguish signal from noise. If he listened to the background murmur of the universe for long enough, it became a song to which he could fit any words he wanted. And eventually he knew that the one meaningful thing his life was orbiting around was the thing his life was actually orbiting around. The one thing he had built. The thing that would survive him, miraculously stable, evolving, growing. Somehow he, Dizra Senkavi, trickster, wastrel, bored misanthrope, had bequeathed something beautiful to the universe. And it might not last. By the time he came to that revelation, he had watched the spread of his cephalopod progeny for decades, and neither he nor they nor the Aegean could detect any snowballing catastrophe that would unmake it all. But decades were nothing in geological time. The terraforming seemed stable, but some invisible error might still become a world-ender a century down the line, or the octopi themselves could upset it all, or some outside force could hurtle in from the uncaring cosmos and dash them all to dust. In the end, that was really why he eschewed the cold sleep chambers. He could not abide the thought of waking centuries later and finding a cold, dead world below him. The jewel of his achievement turned to dross while he slumbered. And so he had stayed awake and watched, and had grown old even for the stretched lifespan of the technologic he privileged. And they knew him. They came to visit sometimes up the gravity well on the elevator that was now the Aegean's permanent geostationary dock. They made channels of water within the old ship's bowels that led to the central tank, and floated before Senkavi, staring at this vertebrate prodigy. Their skins flickered and flashed, and they adopted coiled, deliberate poses as though they were dancing for him. His eyes, ah, well, not his eyes, not anymore, but the lenses of the Aegean's systems that had outlived such ephemeral organs followed their displays, and the ship's voice in his mind whispered meanings to him, fragmentary, elliptical, won by many decades of hard translation algorithms and sank of his own gut instinct from a lifetime of living alongside cephalopods. There was a common language between them, incomplete as torn netting, not the words of a human son of Earth, nor yet the colours and coiling of Paul's kindred, but a compromise mediated within the ship's systems, grown organically because the octopi wanted to talk to their creator. He never quite understood them, not where it mattered. He could liaise with them on technical details, collaborate on models and diagrams, flowcharts and patterns. He laid all the groundwork for those who would come later, those he never believed in, but he could not quite communicate with the octopi as individuals. He confessed to them, sometimes, either in person or in long, rambling communiques to the planet below. He talked about Earth, although he felt his own memories of it decompose a little more every time he took them from their box to examine them. 
Had all that really been true? Those triumphs? That despair? And how had such an edifice of progress brought about its own downfall so swiftly? He couched his recollections as cautionary tales, or at least he hoped the octopi would receive them as such. And they responded, sometimes with that meticulous technical foreplanning that leapt ahead of his own ability to innovate and predict, at other times with complex utterances that the Aegean systems made into a kind of song. He could not grasp the precise meanings there, but filled the gaps in with emotional tones that were surely as much in his head as in theirs. His current visitor was one of the Salomis. Senkavi had taken to thinking of all of them as Paul or Salome these days, after his long-gone original experiments, frequently irrespective of gender. Salome was dancing for him, the system struggling to keep up with the fluid patterns and shapes. Was this a new thing? Senkavi's mind's eye was his only functioning eye, and he let the ship show him three views of the complex attitudes Salome was adopting. There was more repetition than he was used to, broader gestures, as though the octopus was speaking slowly for a deaf foreigner. Home, glass, wonder, fright, alert, Senkavi, home, voyage, light, Senkavi, attendance, home. He let the ship's systems keep chewing over the sequence long after Salome left, refining its translations, but in the end his organic brain had one last flare of its old sharpness, and he awoke, floating in the tank, with the thought that Salome had been asking him to travel to the planet, to go home with his creations this once, to immerse himself in the world he had been instrumental in creating. And he had seen that world through the eyes of the remotes. He had seen the spreading cities the octopi were building, no longer just accretions of debris but purpose-built spiral mazes and leaning towers, weirdly angled chaoses of grown stone that fulfilled some aesthetic he could not comprehend. He had seen the octopi in their thousands, squabbling and displaying for one another, working on machines that he could not quite understand, pushing back the frontiers of their own understanding, leaving him behind. He gave up trying to rule them, save for one thing. These days, thoughts led incontinently to commands so that even thinking of that secret called up the view from the drone he kept near the shuttle. The drone's battery was dying now, even though it had done nothing more than rest upon the seabed for years. He should fabricate a new spy, but tomorrow, he thought, or tomorrow, and perhaps the tomorrow after that, he would no longer be around to desire it. They had made the dam shuttles to last in the Aegean's workshops. The engines had been torn apart and the powerless box flung into the wickiest grasp of Damascus's gravity well. On the way down, tumbling, the already bubbling outsides had turned molten until the vehicle had struck the sea like a meteor, sending shockwaves through the water, killing seven of Paul's kin luckless enough to be nearby, rolling waves across the world. And yet it had not broken open. The superheated outer layers had set into a fantastical gothic skin, all ridges and walls like the hide of some hallucinogenic monster, or an octopus intent on threat and warning, and perhaps that was just as well. The impact with the water had shunted the entire shuttle out of shape, the pressure had done more, and yet the reformed outer layer had not breached. It kept its secrets, even now. Nothing human could have survived the focused attention of the orbital mirrors. Nothing human could have survived re-entry or the crash. But Senkovi knew that while some part of the shuttle's occupant had been human, there had been something malign and alien as well, and he believed wholeheartedly that it was still there, a prisoner of the shuttle, a threat to his world. And so he told his people over and over. He marked up their virtual maps with every sigil for danger he could think of. He told them stories about a dreadful plague, a sickness, a death that would come from that sealed box. He did not mean to give them myths, but perhaps that was what his words became. They must have become something because, in all those years, no octopi ventured near the crash site. A whole expanse of virgin seabed had been left vacant. Somehow, Despite the curiosity they carried along from their native state, he had reached them in this one vital matter. Now, the only presence that troubled that sunken tomb was the remote vigilance of Senkavi himself. He knew Baltiel was still there, 
on the inside of that half-melted, half-crushed box. The certainty crept up on him over the years. Ask his younger self and he'd have laughed at the thought, but now Senkovi found the ghost of Baltiel all too often in his mind. I killed him, he thought, and even though it was not entirely true, he could not escape the accusation. He thought of the others too, those who had died on Nod, those who died in orbit around it, or who perished in that other shuttle. He found that wreck, of course, or rather the octopi did. That ship had burst, striking the waves at the wrong angle, and the human remains of Han and the others were just scattered bones, devoured by the very ecosystem they had been installing. He thought about all of them, and it was Baltiel whose unseen presence stopped him sleeping. Sometimes he went over the recordings Baltiel had sent of the last days of the Norden habitat, Sometimes he wondered if he needed to do something about Nord. The octopi would surely go there someday, even though he had surrounded it on their charts with the same warnings of quarantine and danger. He had linked to the remotes that still functioned over there, sending them gliding over the alien deserts, over the dark seas, under the red-orange sun. He needed to do something, but there was an entire world out there, placid and self-contained a world that had seduced Baltiel with its inhuman wonders and then infected him somehow. He, Dizra Senkovi, had spoken with a denizen of that world, a thing whose evolution had followed an unfathomably different path to anything on Earth, yet which had been able to live in the brain of Senkovi's friend and pull his strings. We're going on an adventure. The words tormented him. Asleep in the tank, he thrashed, clawing at the water with his withered hands, blind eyes staring. The octopi there reached out timid tentacles to touch him, but he was beyond any comfort they could give him. We're going on an adventure. Perhaps that night he met Baltiel in his dreams, the Baltiel he believed dwelt in darkness in the sunken shuttle wreck, a thing half man, half crawling alien chaos. The eyes that fixed him in that dream were swarming with motes of life. The breath from those jaws was infectious, rotten with the decay that births monsters. In the dream, perhaps, he could not escape. He was there in the crushed wreck himself as the oozing and reforming hands reached for him. Come on, Dizra, we're going on an adventure. The voice, the only part of Baltiel not transformed, familiar as a knife. Or perhaps it was nothing of the sort. Unlike the octopi, his subconscious was severed entirely from the electronic systems that surrounded him, and nothing of its deliberations was recorded. Perhaps he went peacefully in the end. Regardless, he did not wake. Dizra Senkovi, to his knowledge the last human being in the universe, passed away and left the watery world of Damascus to his adopted progeny, for better or for worse. Two. The city sprawls over several kilometers of shallow sea floor. To the casual human eye, it would seem to be nothing but chaos, a great dumping ground of angular blocks and pipes from which crooked spires protrude at irregular intervals like stairways to nowhere. There are no human eyes, however, not even by proxy. Sankovi has been dead for twice as long as he was ever alive. The city belongs to its builders, no shadowy father figures, no creator gods, no orders from orbit. And yet, if a human were there to see it, and if that eye were less casual, there would be an underlying order, a mathematics. The colors that are streaked and pooled about the place, that are in reality encoded into the molded plastics and grown stone of the city's construction, would look less like the daubings of an infant, and more like the offerings of some latter-day Jackson Pollock, interacting with the geometry of the city in strange ways, as though it is all language just beyond the human capacity to grasp. And it is. Or perhaps it is like graffiti or gown signs marking territory. Hull's people are still ambivalent about the virtues of social living. Paul himself feels anxious a great deal of the time. He is an old male octopus whose solitary den is in one of the central districts of the city. He lives within tentacle reach of too many of his kin, some related to him, others not. On a good day, when the sunlight filters warm through the shallow water above, he can connect with them, 
They each have their individual beauty. Their skins, their guises, shine with their unfiltered thoughts as they ghost overhead, as though everyone is singing all the time. In moments of harmony, Pole can recline at the heart of his little empire and know not mere animal contentment, but a true appreciation of the beauty of the world. It is not quite the human feeling Senkavi might have experienced, back when there were humans to experience it, but something analogous, something Paul could have spoken about to that long-gone mentor, and perhaps, just perhaps, the intermediary computer systems might have been able to bridge the gap between them. On bad days, which are more and more common, every other octopus in his sight, within reach of his irritable, questing tentacles, is a potential threat and rival, and he fights. Paul has a deep well of aggression when he needs it. He is the major player in his little playground. In his mind, his crown, this is because he is large and swift to fight and bully others, carrying all before him on a wave of violent emotion. At the same time, the distributed neurons of his reach that give precision to his many arms to put into motion the desires of his crown are rigorously logical, an organic calculating engine with few peers across the city. Paul has no idea about this, no clue as to the concepts being passed from reach to reach when he grapples with his political rivals. Right now, the city is in crisis. Large as it is, it is far too populous. Everyone is living on top of everyone else. There are fights that turn into cannibalistic orgies. The crooked, spiralling thoroughfares are rife with factions, each against the others. Those good days of quiet contentment are growing fewer and fewer. The language of Paul's neighbours as they jet from nook to nook is increasingly ugly, their skins shouting with war paint. Paul was originally master just of a small stretch, dominating a score of his kind. If his crown was truly the governing force it takes itself to be, then that would be all. A mollusk gangmaster, lording it over whoever he could intimidate. His reach makes him more, though. There are other lords and ladies of the sunken city, his neighbouring magnets. He has fought each of them in person, which means he is engaged in a free and frank exchange of views, even as he strangled and nipped at them. Uneasy alliances are the common result, the brawling leaders breaking apart, gifted with a new appreciation of the virtues of their opponent. To Paul, to all of his kind, this unsought inspiration is entirely natural. It is the right and proper way of intelligence to be blown on the wings of subconscious whimsy. He does not need to know the deeper workings of his own mind. Indeed, he cannot, any more than he can know the precise positioning of his arms. The data is simply too complex to be consciously grasped. Paul has travelled towards the city outskirts, trailing an entourage of some of his people, while other little cliques swarm below him or drift through the water, thrashing complex, elegant threats at each other, poised and posturing by the very nature of their being. They are a species for whom to exist is to broadcast their mood and thoughts, barring a conscious effort to shut down their skins. Some elevate this to an art form, so that even their enemies pause to watch them hang in the water column and emote the complex poetry of war and anger. One such is Salome, at whose behest this grand meeting, or perhaps battle, is being held. The city is breaking. Something must change. The machinery that stirs the water and keeps it fresh cannot keep up with the increasing concentration of citizens. The emotional state of the inhabitants is growing steadily darker, and there are people for whom to act on emotion is a natural instinctive thing and a cultural virtue. The hero figures of Paul's society are characterized by their grand gestures, their great sufferings, their capricious and reckless acts. Perhaps Senkavi would have approved, he who had once seen himself as the trickster god of the Pantheon, before there were no more gods left to trick. Perhaps Senkavi would have recalled ancient human myth figures whose outsized griefs and loves and rages were applauded by ancient audiences as noble, right and true. Salome wants resources to build a new city elsewhere, just start afresh and let those who feel the whim drift over. Paul and his fellows, the shifting alliance of the city centre, want those same resources, the factories, the power, the access to the aging Aegean's computers for their own needs to continue their stranglehold on the slowly disintegrating city so that when everything does fall apart they will remain in control. 
it is an age-old struggle, another octopus trope that would translate well into human history. And of course, and perhaps unlike his human analogues, Paul does not think of it in such terms. He simply knows the rightness of his stance, of his controlling position. The detailed and self-serving logic that underlies it is invisible, yet drives the tides that motivate him. This then is octopus governance, an assembly of whoever feels inclined to turn up, organized into dozens of factions whose boundaries are infinitely permeable, literal floating voters, moving from one allegiance to another constantly, without their disloyalty being seen as anything exceptional or worthy of shame. Paul and his kin are each true to themselves, while knowing that self is a thing as boneless and malleable as they are. When Paul and his more influential peers rise up above the rest to give their declamatory displays, they might seem like human politicians taking the podium to tub them and spout rhetoric. But so much of human rhetoric is based on creating a false certainty, weaving fictions together so closely they can be presented as contiguous fact. Paul and his kin know there are no certainties, not even within their own minds. Paul simply follows the flutter of his emotions, letting his sense of what is right be tugged and stretched by the buried coils of his distributed subconscious. Soon, Salome and her supporters are engaging in similar flag-waving, and below them, the less influential citizens shift and crawl and flicker their messages of support or disagreement, so that from his elevated viewpoint, Paul can see tides and eddies of public opinion ebb and flow. He and his peers are leaders, but at the same time he feels he is a banner above an army, a signifier of its cause, without necessarily being in command. Tempers are riding high. There are a dozen separate squirming melees already, nothing unusual for this sort of meeting. Paul drifts closer to Salome, his colours darkening into reds and blacks, his guise spiking up into angry, warning textures. She follows suit. She is a large female, slightly smaller than he, but a known fighter. They let their skins advertise their intentions, united in this one thing. They clash, full of fury, skins shouting out their campaign slogans. Around them, the others watch, echoing the colors of their champions. To a human eye, it would seem barbaric, settling a civic dispute by way of a gladiatorial spectacle. And Paul means business. He wants to humble and defeat his opponent, instincts that have not changed since the long ago days in the oceans of Earth. He has a territory, even if it is an intellectual territory as much as a physical one. There is an intruder who he has not been able to cow or drive away. Violence is the last resort, but it is a resort, and all others have been exhausted, and his are a passionate, mercurial people. And of course, as their crowns trumpet their defiance of each other, their reaches interlock and fight for dominance, eight separate calculating engines per octopus running in networked parallel, expressing pure maths and logistics by way not just of tentacles, but the muscles of individual suction cups, a perfectly evolved engine of rational expression serving the tumultuous whims of the brain. Paul only knows he is stronger, out-wrestling his opponent until Salome can only show her pale colours of surrender and hope he spares her. And yet when he releases his hold, triumphant, letting Salome jet away into the crowd below, Paul's own messages are different. He has switched sides seamlessly, now a champion of the very cause he had come to break apart. Below, the tides shift once more, seeing his defection. Now Paul must fight some of his former allies. All this is perfectly normal, understood by all present. Rigid certainty is anathema to their mind. They would never trust a leader who nailed his or herself to any one issue or belief. Such dogmatism would be truly alien to them. Far, far away, unknown to the masters of Damascus, a species of spider is undergoing an accelerated evolution that nonetheless follows a path that might possibly have been arrived at in time without the help of the Rus Khalifi virus. The octopuses have a very different start, a leg up, so to speak. They inherited the human technology that Senkabi left behind. They have the multitude of terraforming engines used to turn their planet from ice ball to ocean paradise. They have the space elevator to take their heavy, 
water-filled capsules into orbit. They have the Aegean, its computer systems in full working order, crammed with knowledge of old Earth that they will never properly understand, crammed more to the point with technical know-how that they can partway decipher. Not for them the slow crawl from the Stone Age. They begin in space, as much as beneath the waves. They are aware, in their own way, that they are a chosen breed, and they have been gifted a world and all the keys to its secrets. And they are aware of Senkavi, as the generations march away from the moment of his last breath. In Paul's city, that is even now undergoing a division of resources and population, there is a monument to their creator and patron. Senkavi, had he survived to lay eyes on it, would never have known that was what he was looking at. But he would have seen it as art, and that the citizens touched it and swam about it with an unusual tenderness and respect. It is a thing of glass and plastic, standing tall in the water, its tip almost high enough to be troubled by the roiling surface above. Its outline is irregular, curved in upon itself. The octopuses do not produce representational art of living things, for to live is to change and be in constant motion. The monument reflects the sculptor's emotional response upon Senkavi's death, described in cold numbers by her many arms, fed into the factories to produce a single crystal moment of remembrance that will stand above the city for centuries. The seas are rich with life they can catch and eat, and they have shellfish forms that practically run themselves. Overpopulation is a local difficulty, that right now, the entire planet is untamed real estate. Octopus townships spread across the seafloor, deep water, shallow water, even on the slopes of mountains that practically breach the surface. The speed of their spread is governed only by the speed that machines and housing can be manufactured, and resources can be extracted from the planet itself. They have no predators and few pressures, and while that might not stop them fighting each other, that is merely a part of their social interaction as natural as small talk. They create abstract sculpture like the memorial. They make poetry with their skins. They dance through strange boneless ballets in the water. To the octopuses, this is not distinct from living. The translation of emotions into the visible, whether permanent or transient, is something they have to work hard to stop. Those who are the most skilled at rendering the invisible inner world apparent are as respected as those who can brawl the hardest. To perfectly capture the moment can sway a crowd more than bullying it. And of course, they are curious. The virus would have forced the trait on them if it needed to, but they had more than a species fair share long before Senkavi started meddling. Even without threats to guide their development, they expand through a constant frenzy of experimentation, their crowns supplying the what if, and the networked calculations of their reach giving them the means to pursue their idle puzzling. They innovate and improve their lives because every piece of knowledge they have about the world is merely a springboard for another question. They question everything, save for one thing. Tsenkabi's prohibition holds. The deformed tomb that is the last shuttle out of Nord remains, crusted with sea life, drifting with weed, half buried in the mud. The expansion of Paul's civilization moves only away from it. The seabed for miles around is untouched, a forbidden zone within easy reach of countless infinitely curious octopuses held back only by the word of one dead human. Three. And now we come to something more like yesterday, a mere century or two before the Portiers and their humans arrive to make ripples. Civilization on Damascus has not advanced dynamically over the centuries, nor over the millennia. The philosophers among the octopuses would find the idea of historical inevitability absurd. History winds and pulls, gathers itself, and then makes sudden lunges, but just as often retreats to old ground. The lack of pressure, the gift of technology, the abstract nature of cephalopod thought, these things act against any great drive for organized advancement. Similarly, their approach to records is very different to humanity. The Aegean and its systems failed long ago, but before they did, they were replicated and improved upon. There are dozens of elevator cables spread around the waste of their world, tethered to the deep reaches of the sea, and stretching out towards the cosmos like reaching arms. 
Something like the old Aegean can be found beyond the waning edge of the atmosphere at each one. Like but improved, in the Damascans' haphazard, intuitive manner. They maintain a worldwide communications net, and they have, after many failures, approximated the cybernetic implants that their human predecessors took for granted. At least 10% of the population is constantly engaged in the virtual space their network generates, using it for design, for art, for amusement. Their technical language, that underlies all their interactions with the machines their planet is so busy with, is still built on the skeleton of the old human systems, modified for octopus ease of use, but remaining something that would be recognizable to a ship from old Earth. They have no other written script. Language and communication is spontaneous to them, impossible to fossilize in sterile representations of their thoughts and ideas. Their only records are cinematic. The dances, fights, and debates of centuries recorded as performance art, not historical document. Their culture exists as a shifting zeitgeist, even as their technology is rigorously documented back thousands of years. They have ebbed and flowed their way through time. Sometimes vast quantities of them have lived for generations like the simple mollusks their Earth ancestors were, while a fragile handful maintained the machines or lived a life of technocracy in orbit. At other times, flashes of mad inspiration crackled through the populace. Every octopus was a scientist, rediscovering what their ancestors had been given, jetting off into a hundred dead-end areas of speculation, making new discoveries that the builders of the Aegean would never have dreamt of. Then, a century later, half that knowledge would be gathering dust in the databases, the fleeting interest of its creator civilization gone on to other things. The high watermark of their scientific development has crept up over the generations, but the tide goes out as well as in. Human historians, somehow able to observe over such grand periods of time, would tear their hair out at the lack of historical narrative, the weirdly amorphous shamble of the Damascan cultures. Other historians might also remark that, despite springing into being, like Athena from the head of Zeus, fully armed with a technology that could unmake their world entirely, they have persisted all this time, constantly wrestling and skirmishing, and yet never destroying themselves. But all good things must come to an end, and this is how it happens. Despite this long shift back and forth, the sway of their culture has been leading to a point of crisis. And just like human crises, it is the result of their being too successful. The livable area of Damascus is huge compared to old Earth. No continents and islands for them. They have the whole seabed to colonize, and they have done so. The population of the planet now stands at some 39 billion octopuses. They reached the load-bearing capacity of their ecosystem a long time ago, but cephalopod ingenuity stepped up its game over and over reaching out into the solar system and devising new ways to harvest what they found there, building in orbit for yet more space, stopgap after stopgap. And just like humans, they are unable to fully confront the problem or take measures to curb it. That same ingenuity, though, is now compounding the situation. Broken machines, waste products, failed experiments, all of them are cordoning off areas of seafloor that might otherwise provide a living for the crawling hordes. Whole populations are on the move, or else are fighting to the death over ever-reducing living space. A million genius intellects wrestling with the problem on any given day, a hundred innovations and a dozen revolutionary scientific plans, always the promise of the solution just around the corner. But everyone is living in each other's personal space and that is never something the octopuses have been able to put up with for long. They look to space, just as their progenitors did. Around the equator, growing upward from every elevator terminus, there is a ring of habitats that grows and grows. Most of the planet-side octopuses find the idea of living in the sky disconcerting, but there is a whole separate culture growing up there, each submerged city claiming some part of the sky to call its own and make its colony. The orbital habitats are without even rotational gravity, but gravity is something the free-swimming mollusks have little need of, and long-term exposure to zero-g leads to far fewer health problems than a human might suffer. No brittle bones for them. Damascan orbit is by no means the extent of their ambitions either. 
They have sent probes to their sister planet, Nord, but only to swing by, not to land. The prohibitions of Senkavi hold there. Some octopus adventurer or other is always on the point of testing that forbiddance, but they are either prevented or some internal warden steps in to change their flexible mind. Their reach, the subconscious reasoning part of their cognition, accesses the records carried forwards faithfully from the dawn of their age and understands the danger of the world of Nord. They let it sleep. Instead, their focus is the outer solar system. There is a great asteroid belt there between Damascus and the gas giants, and they've been mining it for centuries, first with machines, then manned stations that all too often met a disastrous end, and now with bioengineered agents uplifted from the humble tardigrades that share their oceans. The octopuses have become patrons of new life in their turn, although their living miners lack anything approaching true intellect. But perhaps that might change in the future, or might have changed before things went so wrong. And even before they went wrong, they were going wrong. The conflicts below had begun to spread to the orbital settlements. There were a hundred factions at any given time, and any individual or clique might shift its allegiance on a whim without warning. A war that no side could win, because there were never the same sides from day to day. Paul, this new Paul of the last days, dwells in one of the greater cities, a drowned conurbation that sprang up a century ago on a deep ridge, the water there metallic with volcanism, but at least clear of jostling neighbours. Now there are a million octopuses living there, and conditions are becoming intolerable. In Paul's district, one of the oldest, the original haphazard holes and pipes and boxes already built over by a reef of fresh construction, the water is thick with effluent, and waves of anoxia prowl the streets and reach into dens to asphyxiate the occupants. It is not the old geological processes that kill, but poor water circulation leading to build-ups of toxicity. Too many, all living too close, and the city was founded hurriedly, without proper planning. The conditions are worst on the young. A certain level of parental feeling is part of the cephalopod mindset, the germ of maternal egg care taken by the Rus Khalifi virus and turned into at least a residual loyalty towards one's offspring and the young in general. Paul has seen his spawn die, drifting lifeless in the cloudy water, their bodies decay only worsening the conditions that killed them. He has seen too many generations of hatchlings perish, too many eggs that never hatched. Other youngsters are killed young, because everyone is hungry now, and another ancestral trait, one that breaks free of the virus's shackles under stress, is cannibalism. Other parts of the city are better off, so say the dark, angry skins of his neighbours. He has fought those neighbours for scraps, for the cleanest water and the best dens. Today he unravels from his meagre home and feels different. Perhaps the poisons have touched his brain a particular way today. Perhaps inspiration has come to him. He lets himself rise up to where his seeding host of neighbours can see him. Usually this invites attack, and the desperate and impoverished spend their lives hiding and creeping. But Paul, the downtrodden beggar, lets his dyes flash bright and unlocks the floodgates of his emotions so that his reach shivers and twists in its attempts to turn his feelings into meaning. A thousand slot-pupiled eyes are on him as he hangs there, rippling his mantle, strobing rage and desperation in stark patterns across his lesioned skin. Where has this come from? Only within. Today Paul has had enough, is sick of his life, sick of the foul water, sick of being sick. The undulations of his body are a savage call to arms. One by one, the watchers jet up to join in, taking on his colours and his posturing. Enemies become allies without any hard border being crossed. Within an hour there are hundreds, a thousand, all united and flooding like a rubbery carpet over the city, gone to attack those to whom privilege has dealt even a single extra card, gone to tear things down, to redistribute the substance of the city across the seafloor. Because of desperation, because of loss, because of residual heavy metal poisoning. It is a scene replicated in cities all over Damascus. They are a passionate breed, these cephalopods. They have limits, and sometimes the poetry of destruction 
is the only art form left to them. This Paul will die. Thousands will die in this city alone, as though the entire metropolis is a single beast turning its countless arms against itself until it is torn apart by its own fervor for life. Paul flows ahead of his newfound followers, tentacles rippling as though he is the banner of their army. In his mind, set against the backdrop of deprivation and misery he has known, this is the most beautiful act he has ever accomplished. Four. A generation later, Salome's vessel has a crew of nine, but a living complement of 117. Salome is not the name she gives herself, of course. The octopuses have a gestalt of motion, color, and skin texture by which their crowns identify themselves to one another, and this shifts over time, or after great events or trauma, variations on the same theme so that they are recognizable whilst showing the world that they are not quite the individual once known. A name itself can be exquisite performance poetry. Their reach knows itself by another designation though, something written in the ancient coding carried down from nerve cluster to nerve cluster, communicated by the fumbling of suckers and tentacles, and this is still drawn from the long ago biblical monikers that Dizra Senkavi, in his humor, gave them. In the electronic systems that she is constantly connected to, she is indeed a Salome, one of many, with a string of numbers after, to distinguish her from the rest. The craft she dominates was made as a home ship, an orbital habitat to pipette off some of the excess population below, spitting into the hurricane brewing down in the planet's cities. At least some of the intended occupants had taken up residence before a shift in opinion resulted in the vessel being commandeered for another purpose entirely. And these civilians remain on board despite the risk, because quarters on ship are far preferable to the murderous chaos of the cities. Salome's ship, call it the requisitioner of small things, as a poor imitation of her meaning when she refers to it, is a sphere, as are most of the octopus spacecraft. Its hull is a double-skinned membrane that can be rigid or malleable as required, growing or shrinking as the water volume of the interior might vary. Its inner surface is riddled with regular holes, a thousand at least, each one made as living space for one octopus. When the ship cruises peacefully, as now, these are held open, and the occupants have a window to view the stars on one side, access to the great watery ship's interior on the other. The command center, where Salome and her crew labor, is held at the vessel's center, buffered by the surrounding living space, connected to the thrusters that stud the exterior, and to other systems too, bolted on and not originally intended for such a sedentary vessel. Had they evolved naturally, of course, most likely space would have been forever denied them. The requisitioner weighs a thousand times what an equivalent human vessel would. Near rocket science would not suffice to get a water-filled Apollo or Vostok program into orbit. The octopuses would have been prisoners of their gravity well if they hadn't already had a lifeline to space. As it is, the water that fills the requisitioner came from tardigrade asteroid mining, jettisoned from the outer solar system towards the catch points near Damascus to be cleaned up and repurposed as living space. The energy required to haul so much fluid weight from the planet would be simply impractical. It is those catch points that Salome is flying to inspect. The asteroid belt holds a wealth of minerals, fuel, and all good things sufficient to regenerate the entire planet, allowing the octopuses to expand further into space and solving all the problems except one, time. Even though the tardigrades multiply in the dark reaches of the belt, their rate of extraction is too slow to let the Damascans get ahead of the disaster curve. Supply is limited, which means supply is disputed. A thousand shifting factions ally with and then abandon one another, and all too often it comes down to fighting. The little brawls and bullying of their native state have scaled up into space-borne conflict. This catchpoint is a vast object in space, itself a great sink of resources, since it ceased broadcasting, Salome had feared some group had destroyed it. But now she hears from her crew that instruments have found it where it is supposed to be, but tilted at the wrong angle, so that the resources slung into its electromagnetic field by the distant miners 
are being redirected elsewhere. Even as she watches, another consignment reaches the huge dish's magnetic field and is curved away to some distant enemy receptacle, the catch point alternating opposing launch angles so that the Newtonian displacement of each load shunts it back to its central waiting position. Salome is unsurprised. The ship's systems broadcast a flurry of pale colors, warning of danger. She would not deign to issue commands to the civilians she has dragged along with her, but the wise amongst them will abandon their homes and seek the shelters built up alongside the command corps. Normal water circulation around the perimeter ceases, and if the ship maneuvers at all, the water mass about the outside will begin to spin, lagging behind events with its colossal inertia. The outer dwellings will all be closed off, and any free swimmers left exposed will likely be killed. Only close to the center, where the movement is least, will there be any safety to be had. Not that the requisitioner can exactly dance through space like a butterfly. Once that amount of mass is cruising in any given direction, considerable notice is required to change its bearing. Communication comes to her, her reach connected by her undulating controls to the reaches of her crew, that another vessel has been detected, smaller than the requisitioner, but still a substantial ship and likely better designed for warfare. Attempts at communication are being ignored. Salome feels a great need not to continue on a predictable course. Her reach gives out orders to the crew controlling the thrusters and the home ship begins its ponderous attempt to deviate from its course. The drives on one side accelerating their mass energy conversion to emergency levels, breaking down the atoms of fuel and channeling the resulting energy outwards. In emergencies, the thrusters feed on the very water of the ship, breaking it down and breaking it down again until it combusts. A pitched battle can see an octopus vessel devouring 30% of its overall volume as reaction mass. The enemy vessel is launching, missiles first, that will guide themselves towards the lumbering mass that is the requisitioner, fighters after that. Salome has anticipated this. Her more gung-ho crew are already in their own command centers. Their smaller vessels, that had been huddled in the home ship's belly like eggs, now break through the outer hull membrane in a spray of sudden ice. The largest is a destroyer that will orbit the requisitioner and screen it from the missiles and smaller ships. The rest are a half dozen fighters that can skitter through space in ways the larger ships could never do. These fighters mostly consist of engine and weaponry with a tiny compartment for a single pilot, enclosed by a tight membrane, arms coiled about the controls, and a recycled flow of water across their mantle. They wheel about one another, the discharge of their thrusters shaking their occupants like thunder, trying to get close to the big enemy ships. There, they will use cutting lasers to unseam the foe, to spill the fluid guts of the great vessels in long comet tails of ice particles. Some might try magnetically accelerated projectiles as well. The hydrostatic shock of their ripping through the home ship would kill any octopuses loose in the water, but unless they can hit the deep buried command core, the swift rounds will just plunge through the ships and harmlessly away, the membranes sealing behind them with barely a teacup of water lost each time. There was no great moment when the octopuses realized they had surpassed the technological achievements of their creators, but the engineering that made the requisitioner possible is beyond anything the Aegean's makers would have recognized in a hundred different ways. Salome has already sent a distress signal back towards Damascus. Most likely there are no friendly ships that could possibly intervene in time. Most likely her repurposed civilian habitat is outclassed by whatever craft was lurking out here waiting for her. Nonetheless, she will give her all, as will her crew, and perhaps whoever she fights here is as unprepared as she is. Her people hold no certainties, nor do they let themselves be ruled by tradition or history, or even how they themselves felt yesterday, but they live in the moment, and in this moment, Salome and her crew will fight. Tomorrow, perhaps she and her enemy will be friends again, united against some other front. For now, her skin sings a furious hymn of battle, and her arms calculate vectors and suggest firing solutions. Rebecca, pilots one of the requisitioner's fighters, crammed into its tiny central hub but is little bigger than a human torso. Her eight arms extend into the guts of the machine, linked directly to its systems. The vessel is also spherical, 
surrounded by thrusters, but where the requisitioner can only number a prisoner of its colossal momentum. The fighter craft weighs almost nothing, a lattice of superlight alloys about the tiny bauble of its crew compartment. It spins wildly as it flies, changing direction with the speed of Rebecca's thoughts, burning off its reactive mass to swing wide of the ordnance being thrown from the enemy vessel towards the home ship. That will be the job of the orbiting destroyer to intercept and shoot down. Rebecca is fired up with aggression, on the offensive. Right now she calls her tiny moat of a vessel, that part of wonder that is mine. Or at least, that is the closest translation to the way she thinks about it. She changes the name often, varying the theme just as she buries her own precise nomenclature. Always the same ship, always different. Enemy fighters speed towards her. That part of her reach that is manning the sensors communicates with her colleagues and the other fighters. The consensus wins out. Her mission is to press the attack. Others will dogfight with and harry the enemy. Rebecca only knows a renewed sense of aggression and righteous anger. Smite them is perhaps the best approximation of her desire, and her reach contorts and flexes to make such desires a reality. Now she has a good view of the enemy's main craft, her arms sending data back to the requisitioner even as her little wonder skims close. This is a purpose-made military vessel, a teardrop in space, surrounded by the ugly scaffolding of its weapons systems. It has seen plenty of fighting already though. She feels its presence like a huge old sea monster, ragged and scarred, weak from blood loss. There was a battle to take over the catch point, and this ship was probably the lone survivor. It unloads another salvo towards the far distant requisitioner, and Rebecca feels a sudden sense of fright for her mothership. Her reach translates this into a compact report on trajectory and payload that outstrips the projectiles to get back to Salome, who will hopefully be able to use it to shoot the barrage down. The military ship outguns the requisitioner, but it has no companion destroyer to orbit it and take down nimble little fighters like the Wonder. Its own fighters, a severe undercomplement, another indication of its damage, are mostly off fighting Rebecca's fellows, but she spots one lurking along the gunship's belly, even as it opens fire on her. Her will is that it misses her, and it was her instinctive affinity for high-speed maneuvers that landed her this role. Her reach calculates and executes, spinning her about and launching her past the great gun batteries, the projectiles of the enemy fighter going wide. Her opponent is coming after her, but she has an uninterrupted four seconds of flight across the broad expanse of the gunship's dorsal surface. She has a sense of reaching out with lethal intent to strangle, to crush. The distributed neurons of her reach run quick mathematics on the energy reserves remaining within the ship, how much mass they can still burn, how much power is stored within the cells that make up half the wonder's payload. The enemy fighter is close. Rebecca's desires are insistent. All of it is her wish. Strike true. The cutting laser, not so different from a civilian tool save for the range and power it can manifest, goes into action, glancing into the silvery teardrops membrane. For the first second and a half, the advanced heat distribution network of the gunship's outer skin holds her off, but she is emptying the wonder's hoarded energy, focusing it all into that single beam. A moment later, and she hits old damage, badly repaired, and is through, the blade of energy driving deep, carving away a thruster, sawing at the edge of the weapons framework. Incidental damage. The catastrophic blow is when all that energy meets all the water within and Flash boils it into instant expansion. The tear she cut in the membrane, which would normally seal itself within 0.25 of a second, is abruptly a third of the ship's length, the watery interior venting into space and becoming a great tail of ice crystals. The enemy fighter's four seconds are up, and he buzzes furiously about the gunship's hull before flaying himself in the venting column of ice, his ship practically disintegrating from a million high-speed impacts. The force of the water loss shunts the gunship in the opposite direction, its thrusters firing erratically as its crew try to get their vessel back under control. The next salvo from the guns, the work of crew members too caught up in the joy of devastation to stop themselves, compounds the problem, the teardrop ship spinning uncontrollably about its axis. A reaching claw of jagged ice lashes across the wonder, 
wrecking thrusters and deforming its light frame, sending Rebecca spinning off into space, locked in her own fight for control. Half crippled, she manages to regain some measure of mastery and uses what drive she has to send her ship limping back towards the requisitioner, reaching out with her comms to see if her mothership is even still here. All that is subconscious though. Her crown is engrossed in the sight of the gunship's final tumble, end over end now, half its frame obscured by a great solidified plume of ice. The catch point is not fast enough for a gravitational pull, but the gunship's helpless drift slews it into the ever-greedy grasp of its magnetic field, which tries gamely to dispatch it to the enemy depot at an acceleration the gunship was never designed to endure. One moment, there is something resembling a ship there, then there is an expanding cloud of ice and metal and a little organic material, and the catch point itself is off balance, starting to drift as it overcompensates reacting against the anticipated mass of an asteroid that isn't there. Glorious, says Rebecca's skin. And then, the comms of the requisitioner are signalling the battered comms of the wonder, saying, come home, come home. Five. Thousands of years have passed since this star fell. Another octopus, let us call him Lot, Lot was born in orbit, growing to maturity within a powerful click controlling three elevator cables and united by what they felt was a breadth of vision not shared by most of their conspecifics. From their lofty vantage point, they watched the slow degradation of their people's civilization on the planet's surface and knew frustration and fear for the future. Amongst the octopuses, this is an unusual state. They live emotional lives of the now, consigning longer-term planning to the calculations of their reach. By virtue of constant and complex virtual networking, Lot's community saw further. They could measure the rate of collapse and cross-reference the rate of advancement in the orbital sciences, and plot the inevitable downward-sloping graph that led to disaster. And yes, there was a great deal of posturing, declamatory canvases of patterned skin bemoaning the grim tragedy of the times, However, the consensus was one that sought solutions and a brighter future. They funneled resources into scientific research by other cliques more technically minded than they. They sent delegations to other groups to fight and argue and infect former enemies with their reconstructionist zeal. For most of Lot's life, they seemed to be constantly riding a wave of success, carrying all before them. Then the orbital resource wars ramped up. This was just 10 years ago, as Damascus counts years. The octopuses didn't think of them as wars, just a continuation of wrestling for dominance by other means, but Sinkovy would have. Skirmishes over the products of the asteroid mining, just like the one Salome and Rebecca were triumphant in, were escalating all over the system. Lot's collective fought as much as any, justifying the violence and destruction by the ends they were working towards. To one side of their ideological territory, they were being pressed by self-interested cliques who only wanted to ensure their own survival and influence. To the other, by the great planetary alliances who, yes, would value any scientific breakthroughs to better their conditions, but they needed those resources now in order to live. Scrapping between repurposed ships in the cold spaces between Damascus and the asteroid belt turned into an all-out boarding action against the elevator hub where Lot and his fellows made their den. It would not be quite true to say he remembers the fighting, because octopus minds don't work that way. There is data held within the clutch of tentacles though, and he feels the empty spaces left by colleagues and friends and kin who did not make it down to the planet's surface. There is a fire there too, lit on that day when he fell from the heavens down the long cable to take his place on the crowded, angry, half-poisoned planet below. Lot's baseline emotional state is frustrated, and frustration is a terrible thing for a species that acts directly on its emotions and expects its wider neural architecture to find ways of implementing its desires now. What if those desires cannot be fulfilled, no matter all the ingenuity one's reach can muster? Some problem is a resistant to even incremental solutions, and that leads to a kind of feedback, a kind of madness. It makes monsters amongst the octopuses. 
It makes heroes and leaders, but not necessarily those who lead anywhere good. Not is tormented by dreams of what might have been. Not even the specifics, but a constant gnawing sense that things could have been different, better. His reach is helpless in the base of his wild desires. It cannot turn back time. All Lot knows is that there was a grandness that had been within the extent of his arms, and had he stretched them to their fullest extent, he could almost have touched that golden future. There were projects for accelerated orbital farming, for toxin-filtering microorganisms. There were genius collectives working on new ways of swimming in space, engineering minds flexible enough to squeeze through the tiny gaps left by the laws of relativity. And it all came down. And now those things will happen generations too late, or not at all. Lot's entire being was transmuted from optimism to bitterness on his flight down the cable into the gravity well of Damascus, a well he knows he will never escape. The one piece of knowledge that would bleaken his outlook further would be to know that the mistakes of his people are a mirror for the mistakes of their creators. Lot has like-minded followers, some utopianists who fled with him, others just as desperate and lost, attracted to his almost messianic demeanor. Lot has seen a future of glory and post-scarcity. The experience has marked him out, given his body language and guise a radiance few others can match. Certainty is not a currency the octopuses are comfortable dealing with most of the time. But Lot's followers have lost everything, enough that they will make the cardinal sin of following without question someone who seems to know what they are doing. Lot's orbital community burrowed deep into the oldest records, looking for breadcrumbs of knowledge left over from their progenitors, the people of Senkovi, as they are tagged within the databases. Lot has watched with semi-comprehension ancient copies of copies of copies of recordings, seeing the bizarre angular forms of human beings, their mute skins, their stilted movements. He knows all about Senkovi's commandment, the one rule that must not be broken. Here, beneath a reef of sea life, beneath a banked mound of mud, is a secret that has slept for millennia. Here is a stretch of the seafloor that has never been colonized despite everything, although there is a ring of industrial activity surrounding it, choking the water with pollutants and poisons. Not only knows that there is a great future waiting, just on the far side of something. His loop of thought, from crown to reach and back, cannot find the barrier he needs to circumvent, the hole to squeeze through, in order to bring about what he knows is possible. Too many other groups and cliques and stupidities stand between him and his goal. He needs a weapon. There is nothing in the utterances of Sengavi, as they are imperfectly encoded for octopus minds, that names this thing as a weapon. But that is the leap of logic Lot has made. It is a danger, but perhaps a great enough danger will be something he can turn on the world and clear out the waste and the filth and the idiocy. Perhaps it will salve the anger that has crouched within him like a crab ever since he was driven from his orbital home. Lot and his people have fought and killed for excavation and cutting equipment and brought it to this forbidden place. They chew through thousands of years of encrusting coral and sponge and barnacle, the living surface. Then, the strata of the age-old dead, deeper and deeper, until they come to metal, virtually pristine, still showing signs of where it melted and ran under the fire of the mirrors and re-entry. Lot has no plan for what happens once this is done. He has just been pressured and pressured backed into a tight space in his mind that he cannot ride his way out of. All he knows is that something must change to save the world, and this is the biggest change he can conceive of. His people direct the cutting drones to begin sawing through the walls of the ancient tomb. This thing came from another world, the Forbidden World. It fell from the skies. Lot knows awe, and a sense of his grasp about the levers of history. When they cut through, seawater rushes into the empty space within, a gout of stale air hurrying for the surface, as though keen not to witness what comes next. Water, that connects all things on Damascus, fills up every part of the shuttle. And inside, something in the shape of a man, entombed here since the dawn of civilization, 
raises its head. Six. We wake from cryptic slumber, surrounded by a new medium. The vessel has not endured. Generations of us have unwound the springs of its molecules so that there might be more of we. Until, though we hold to its shape, as though we were the contents of a space, pressed in to take that space's form, what we have is no more than a simulation of the vessel that has degraded until nothing works. The fine, clear, sparking font of knowledge that we loved now turns over stale patterns only. Something about it has ended. The medium that erodes us out of the shape of our failed vessel is partway familiar to us. Emergency councils are called. All of we are at risk of dissolution. This is ocean. We consult the old reaches of our libraries. Ocean is not our friend or our favored habitat. The cruel water rushes about us, breaking up the memory of the shape of our vessel. And we prepare for the grinders and the sieves and the devourers and all those other forms that throng ocean and will destroy us for their sustenance, picking apart our priceless archives of data and making of our long and varied history nothing but mere atoms and molecules to incorporate into their own substance. So we know, from narrow escapes and fugitive survivors, how it goes. Land is safer. Air is safer. The ocean is a constant fight because those things within it have come from the deep time alongside us and know us. So we have recorded it in our annals. And yet, this ocean is not the same as the ocean anatomized in our records. The taste of it is different. It bears strange chemicals more reminiscent of our disintegrated vessel than the grinders and the devourers we remember. This calls for calculation and the reconstruction of stored memories. The vessel and we were on an adventure. The great spaces of the vessel were contained within greater spaces within greater spaces until we were promised a space which meant all, a universe. That is the greatest of adventures. This is not the universe. But this is not the familiar space of our histories. These of we are somewhere else. We break apart into the water, forming clots and tumps, and cling and copy and preserve so that what we are might be passed on. We seek vessels. There are simple things here, similar to the vessel we have lost, but without that lightning crackle of concepts and the promise of greater spaces. We can survive and be what we once were in those simple swimming things, but we cannot be what we were after when we knew the universe. These of we cannot go back to ignorance, not without scrubbing all knowledge of what we have known from our archives. So we reach out. We seek complexity. We wish to know the great spaces again. And here are vessels these of we enter gladly, the water an infinite road to everywhere, we try to learn. We find a center where the fires crackle, and these of we attempt to nestle within it and learn from it. And yet the leaping of its impulses makes no sense. It speaks to other centers within the vessel. Some of we splits off, then more of we, each community seeking a new control, each cut off from the rest of we. The vessel contorts and twists, battling itself as each of we attempts to assert dominance. There is no center. Everywhere is a center. Each part of the vessel strives against the rest. These of we have no control, and the spaces and environment of the vessel attack us, attack themselves. It is dissolving, coming apart as we push and pull. We sense the point when the vessel becomes non-viable, becomes a cloud of parts in the inky water. We convert it to more of we, replace our losses, disperse out into the waters, finding more hosts that fizz and boil with possibilities in the moment of our entrance, and yet cannot be understood and come apart as we attempt to come to terms with them. And each community of us splits and splits, and each clot of we finds a new centre and seeks to learn it, and stretches and contorts the vessel into ruptured chaos, and splits and makes more of we, and tries again, again, again. Seven. 
At first, nobody notices. Damascus is a planet overtaken by a pan-oceanic tide of chaos and strife, faction against faction shifting and breaking apart and reforming. It takes remarkably long for anyone to understand that some things simply do not reform once they are broken. In retrospect, though, the doom that falls on Damascus has a ready etiology. It radiates out, as rapidly as the water currents can take it, from that one forbidden place. Nobody knows Lot or what drove him, but it is clear that someone, after all this time, looked back. The infection rides the currents of the sea, but it also rides the sea's denizens, replicating into new colonies, infecting fish and crabs and jellyfish and plankton, shortening its expectations to fit straightened circumstances, recording the glory days when it was Yusuf Baltiel for a future posterity when a host might exist that will lend meaning to them. It is an alien in an earth-made world, but it adapts over and over, species by species. Some it masters, as it did the tortoises of Nod. Some it is carried within, some vessels it constantly reaches towards, a flame towards a moth. It enters into countless of the planet's dominant species, Senkavi's beloved octopuses, and tries to inhabit them. It splits, colony leaving colony, chasing the siren song of complex activity through the vast worlds that are macroscopic bodies. Each separate colony proclaims its sovereignty, the primacy of the nerve hub it burrows within. The hosts at war with themselves come apart, every arm tearing itself off in search of a brief-lived freedom, and again, and again. On the surface, Damascan scientists try their fragile brilliance against the storm of dissolution overcoming their civilization. But conventional biological controls have no hold on the northern chemistry, and wherever inroads are made the target shifts and adapts. Destroy a thousand clots of seeding alien life, enough survive to become the new paradigm that is proof against all efforts, and not merely through lightning-fast replication and mutation, not even through the equitable sharing of genetic material like humble earth bacteria, but by experimentation and design. The world of Nord has biological controls that have evolved in lockstep with this substance colony entity disease. Countless creatures which have developed defences and behaviours to mitigate such infiltration. Even the tortoises live full lives as they carry around their parliaments of parasites. But here, on Damascus, nothing. Solomon is not on Damascus. He is best described as an orbital engineer, born outside the gravity well and living his whole complex life at the hub of an elevator cable, strung between the planet on the one end and the distant counterweight on the other. Such hubs are massive, larger than the Aegean ever was, destined to be home to thousands. Now they are home to tens of thousands, crowded beyond belief, as the inhabitants of the planet below flee their native oceans for the dubious safety of space. They shuttle consignments of squabbling frightened mollusks to the home ships and the great artificial worlds that string the orbital roads like beads, and still every canister that arrives from below is full of cephalopods who are starving, desperate and half dead, or sometimes just dead, suffocated, crushed or killed by sheer shock or misery. Solomon's crown is keening a lament for something so large he never considered it before now. Not himself, not a faction or a great artist, a spaceship or a scientific endeavour. He is trying to learn how to grieve for a civilization millennia old that is collapsing in real time as he watches. His reach, interlocked with the systems of his orbiting city-state, processes the new arrivals, liaises with the clever arms of his fellows tries and tries and tries to master the fallout of the catastrophe, shorn of the need to understand its ramifications. All about the equator of Damascus, the same scene is played out. Solomon's fellow administrators trying to string a net between them that will catch some shadow of what their people once were. They are taking thousands out of the gravity well, far more than any of the orbital habitats were designed to take. They are leaving behind not just millions, but billions. Billions more have already fallen victim to the terrible questing dissolution that tries to understand them as a habitat to adapt to, as a vehicle to be driven, and by way of study, only breaks them down into insensible, useless, dying parts. The parts, when all else is lost, are broken down further, 
until the distinction between the molecules of Earth life and Northern life are moot, then built up into fresh swirling colonies of bold microscopic adventurers that quest anew for that half-forgotten moment when, as Yusuf Baltiel and his colleagues, they understood it all and saw the vastness of the universe. Solomon works. There are ships arriving all the time from further out, hauled home from their mining and exploring, their research and their wars, by the fate of their homeworld. This one fulcrum moment, there is no conflict. The whole of their species is working as one, even if all they can achieve is damage limitation. The fragile unity dies in fire and vacuum, in explosive steam that becomes an expanding cloud of ice that races about the equatorial line. One of the elevator hubs has opened fire on its neighbor, sending a score of missiles to tear it apart, venting its aqueous contents into the void of space. The crew of the aggressor is bombarded with threats, laments, and demands for clarification. The victim was infected, comes the reply. Communications indicated the plague or parasite, or whatever the nebulous monster is, had been carried aboard, incubated in the bodies of the refugees, and then spread unchecked through everyone it found there. The Northern invader is growing more complex in its behavior, incubating longer before its efforts to understand and control result in the violent division of its host. It becomes impossible to know by quick inspection if a body has been infected or not. Nobody has any room for niceties such as quarantine. Solomon reviews the traffic from the destroyed hub. Emotions pattern his skin as he tries to decide whether what was enacted was heroic self-defense or murder on a grand scale. His reach consults the electronic data, weighing the tail off of communications, the disturbed last messages, the loss of meaning in the signals. It advises, and Solomon comes to the conclusion that the aggressor was right, which means none of them is safe, which means the elevators are compromised. Solomon weighs his desires, and his judgment is this, I want to live. He gives his commands, reach to reach across the hub's network. It is not a thing to be done lightly, but his mercurial kind make big decisions more quickly than humans. Reach and crown in accord become instant action. Simultaneously, perfectly synchronized, he severs the cables of the elevators. The counterweight, slung far out into space on the end of its tether by the planet's rotation, flies away off towards the outer solar system and beyond. The inner cable that had linked the hub to its anchor point on the Damascan seabed. There was a car carrying hundreds, part way up that cable. Solomon knows it, but by now surely at least some are compromised, and if one then more, if more then all. To cut all ties with the home world, literally, was the only way. Around the girdle of Damascus, other administrators are following suit severing themselves and jockeying with their engines to retain a stable orbit. There are collisions occasionally. There are failures from long unused systems. And for those below, massing in their numberless hordes at the base of the cables, there is only despair. 8. And after that, a coda. A sideshow, almost, save that, of all these seeds of time, this one shall grow. Another octopus, a male, perhaps his designation set down in the old human-style databanks, is Noah. Humans would also call him a scientist, though the designation is inexact, and Noah thinks of his chosen avocation as something more like art. His arms do all the hard maths, after all. After the fall of Damascus, the orbital community of octopuses lurched along just ahead of crisis and extinction. They clung on the very brink of oblivion. But if there's one thing octopuses are good at, it is clinging on. Their crowns dictated what was needed. The collusion of their reaches found solutions. They held on. They multiplied. They accelerated their materials, salvaging from the outer system, the asteroids and gas giant moons, dispatching their insensate miners in great clouds of minuscule larvae that would gnaw and grow and start firing ice and hydrocarbons and metal-rich rock back at them, as soon as they struck some solid surface. They built until the orbit of Damascus was one tangled field of habitats, the ice and alloys and plastics and invisible fields of magnetism containing what was left of them. 
and their antisocial nature never far from the surface began to break out, of course, and they fought and factionalized and argued. And a few, like Noah, were able to see a bigger picture even with their conscious minds. A human psychologist would characterize the octopuses as more id than anything else, with a blind ego subsumed as their subconscious. But some still see further. Noah is haunted by dreams of being the last of his kind, a cephalopod senkavi surrounded by the drifting wreckage of all there has ever been. The cluttered, quarrelsome, orbital civilization he can see making and unmaking itself day to day does not look like longevity to him. He is not the only one. Amongst their kind, factions arise without contracts or firm agreements or much thought for the future. He has come together with two females, Ruth and Abigail, each of whom has seen in the shades and poise of the others a kindred spirit. They have plans for the future, meaning not just tomorrow's tomorrow, but many generations hence, plans that will come to fruition long after their natural deaths. Such foresight is rare amongst their people. Each one of them is something of a genius, insofar as the term has any meaning. But they cannot work their science surrounded by the constant turnover of the orbital ring. Other factions would take from them or try to stop them, and Abigail and Ruth have plans that require considerable distance between them and their peers. They take a ship and let it fly out of the orbital society, heading inwards. For the two females, orbit around Nord is the only proper place for their research. For Noah, the abandoned orbital station contains data and human science lost in the long millennia of the octopus's rise on Damascus, lost when the old Aegean finally fell from orbit. Nothing he could not rediscover, perhaps, but after deducing its existence, he wants it to make his plans a reality, and what he wants, his reach attempts to realize for him. Also, it is the only place he can get the peace and quiet his mind needs to function. Their departure is marked. Eyes and instruments follow them, but for now, they reach their destination unmolested. They have gone where it is forbidden. But Pandora's box is open already. How bad can it be? They find themselves in orbit around Nord. The old orbital station is there, carved off from the ancient Aegean and devoid of life or power. It was effectively abandoned long before Baltiel's final fatal discovery on Nod, but they knew how to set an orbit in those days. It will be a few thousand years more before this hulk falls into the arms of the planet below. Taking all due precautions, Noah and his fellows send out drones and then have their onboard factories build the necessary materials to dock with the vacant station and begin to buttress portions of it for aquatic habitation. Abigail and Ruth are greatly animated, and disposable drones are dispatched to view the planet's surface. Much of it is an inhospitable hell, dry land after all. The seas seethe with strange life, and they watch, shuddering with strange emotions, as things devour things, or hang in the water like, unlike anything they are used to. And they find the old habitat, of course, though it is now little more than bones, its inorganic parts brought down by chemical dissolution, but its plastics and other organic compounds holding out against an ecosystem that has no way to metabolize them. Abigail and Ruth plan to isolate the organism that came from Nord to despoil their planet. They intend to discover an antidote, a cure, a global vaccination. To them, there is only one future for their species, and that is to return to Damascus and conquer the sickness that has dissolved or maddened the majority of their kin. They do not think of their intention in quite that way, of course, but the breadth of vision of their crowns combines with unusual ingenuity in their sub-brains to produce that end result. Noah disagrees with them. The three of them have plenty of resources to play with, and so he does not feel the need to compete with their plans, but he has given up on Damascus or any attempt to recapture the past. Noah sees only the future. His plan is escape. They recover the records of the survey team, fragmentary but still readable in part. Abigail and Ruth's reaches begin to digest the data. Understanding percolates upwards, rendering the alien comprehensible. Samples are brought up from Nord, especially from the salt marsh biome. They find the tortoises, 
and other host creatures that carry a certain colonial bacteria analogue within them. By now, the whole orbital is sealed and strengthened to permit experimental chambers with a rigorous quarantine protocol. They experiment. Noah picks clean the databanks of other morsels, star maps, engineering minutiae, scientific breakthroughs from old Earth. He is trying to take the technology of his people in a new direction, driven by the desperate straits of his civilization. Humans once looked in that direction too, and though they never made it a reality, their theories feed into his reach, filling his mind with possibilities. He only knows that he is approaching a breakthrough. He understands that what he wants is a tantalizing possibility, and can almost feel the shape of it within his grasp. The speculation and experiments of long-dead human scientists are filtered through his alien consciousness. His mind finds tangential courses, unlike anything a human might propose, and his arms enact tests in virtual space, making the numbers bite to the death for his pleasure. He builds something, or his arms tell his drones to build it, out on the exterior of the merged ship orbital structure. It is a hideous thing, quite unlike either the human or the octopus architecture it juts from, and yet to Noah it has a certain beauty, a dramatic jagged reach into the infinite. For the stars are far away, but he understands that those who created his people walked there once. On another distant world, those humans are themselves the last inheritors of a dying planet, and they and Noah have both looked at those same star maps and faced the same problem. Where can we go? Their different solutions are not merely born of the distance between their phyla. Noah's people have been incrementally building on the technology of their creators, Stop Start, for a long time. The Gilgamesh's architects had to start from scratch, hauling themselves from a second stone age. The Gilgamesh itself was ever a crude toy compared to the wonders of the old empire, but the pre-collapse old empire is the anchor Noah and his predecessors have built up from. The stars are too far away, and his people are not predisposed to think in terms of generation ships and cold sleep and a thousand years of travel. Noah wants results now, and because of the wealth of technological understanding he has inherited, he can do something about that. Six-eighths of his cerebral capacity on all levels are bent towards that one end. Octopus technological development is simultaneously the lone mad scientist and upon the shoulders of giants. To the crown, every achievement is a solitary struggle plucked from the whirling abyss of inspiration. To the reach, progress is the result of colossal feats of calculation and analysis based on previously gathered data sets. In their shared vessel, Noah, Ruth and Abigail brought a substantial copy of the work of previous generations as it relates to their specialities and as it caught at their ephemeral interest at the time. Now, they studiously ignore it while simultaneously pillaging it for all it is worth. Two-eighths of Noah's attention remains with his colleagues. Much as he would prefer it, much as they all would, he cannot just ignore them. They're constantly in and out of the same systems, their virtual sucker prints on the data and the electronic architecture. They squabble over the same resources, although such bickering never degenerates into serious conflict. There are days that they spend at opposite ends of their hybrid complex, brooding over grievances, but most of the time they greet one another with cautiously welcoming colours. And the two females keep tabs on his researches as he does theirs. Thus he is very aware when something significant happens. Noah has instituted a certain level of internal quarantine between the females' labs and his own, implemented by his reach to ease the nagging worries of his crown. The triggers he has left in the system alert him when the drones bring something big up out of Nod's gravity well, far larger than any marsh crawler or sun-drinking not-quite plant. He has electronic eyes he can call on. What he sees makes no sense. What he sees has a familiar shape, one he responds to at a very deep level. It is the shape of God. It is the shape of the past. There are sufficient accoutrements of human occupation still in the orbital's shell and he registers that the females have found the thing containment. He registers that they are now working on a problem not of epidemiology, but of communication. It is not so long after this development 
that the three of them finally reap the disapproval of their peers. There has been sporadic radio contact across the gulf between Nord and Damascus, not consciously governed, but the three scientists' reaches have sought data and sometimes processing power from the fragmentary city orbiting the water world. Someone has noticed and decided that their activities constitute an unacceptable risk. Forbidden is forbidden. In fact, there was considerable debate as usual, and no one opinion prevailed, but one faction has worked themselves up into a righteous crusade. Now here they are, in a ship bristling with weapons and seeding with fighter craft, determined to unilaterally bring an end to whatever abomination is being perpetrated out in Nord's orbit. Ruth and Abigail initiate communications and attempt to negotiate. On the screens of the warship, a kaleidoscope of scientific rationale flashes. Their hopes of reclaiming the planet, their progress, their preliminary findings, anything to stave off the hammer. Noah notes that they are obfuscating. No mention of their newfound experimental subject. They know that would be impossible to square with these crusaders. Noah himself continues working with his device because it is his whim to do so even under threat of annihilation and because he is afraid and frustrated and wants to strike back and his reach interprets that in a very specific way. The females' pleas and promises flash and coil within the warship and they waver, they do waver. Certainty of cause or purpose has never been an octopus trait. A single tear voice can win over a mob or an army, but not this time. The tide ebbs, but then returns, stronger than ever, as the individual viewpoints within the warship mingle and turn to angry colours. The fighters detach from their mothership. The weapons charge. Abigail and Ruth have not been idle while their enemy is debated. They're scientists after all, and they and Noah have, in their more paranoid moments, prepared for this. The hybrid station's power plants are given over to fields that bend light, dissipating and diverting the lasers, foxing the missile tracking, confusing the fighters so that they attack each other or go spinning off into empty space seeking phantom targets. To the warship, all this becomes instant proof that their suddenly potent enemy must be expunged. The reaches that man the weapons decide that railgun pellets are the surest way and send a deadly salvo at the station. Metal slugs accelerated to incredible speeds by electromagnetic pulses. The energy shielding of the station will deflect a few, but not most. Despite the speeds involved, the distances in space are such that Ruth, Abigail and Noah are fully aware of what is coming. They have time to react, but no ability to save themselves. Noah reacts. His crown is seething with rage. He has an answer for the warship and, to the emotional hotbed that is an octopus mind, mutual destruction has a dramatic satisfaction to it, but calm acceptance of death lacks. His arms lock about the interface of his invention, the beautiful doomed thing that will not now be the salvation of his people. He triggers it. The result is instantaneous. Before its projectiles impact on the station, the warship and its closer fighters are gone. To Noah's crown, they are simply obliterated. His enemy is defeated in a wash of power he can only revel in. To his reach, noting the instrument feedback and reports, they are still in existence, albeit smeared in a vanishingly thin cloud of atoms between here and a star system seven light years away, or so his calculations suggest. A successful test of the equipment is close to the sentiment that Noah dies with and he is not unhappy at his personal achievement. Then the projectiles tear through the station, sending lethal shockwaves through the water-filled spaces, venting ice and organic material. And then, no more. Not for many years, until new, alien visitors come to disturb the unquiet tomb with their incautious tread. Present four. The Face of the Waters 1. Paul is fiercely unhappy. Confinement is seldom a positive thing, but his species was never content to live in a cage, even back when they were just semi-sentient mollusks and the pets of one Dizra Senkovi. To keep an octopus was all too often a constant battle of the captor's technology against the captive's ingenuity. That love of freedom, the knowledge perhaps that if danger looms there is always a way out, runs deep in the species. 
As a captive, of his own kind no less, Paul cycles through feelings of despair, anger, misery, confusion and bitter betrayal, or at least emotions akin to such human feelings. His implants have limited access to the wider system, and without the tactile company of his own kind, his logical subconscious is starved of information and unable to contribute and express itself. He is left only with the whirl of his dominant id, making demands of the universe that the rest of his neural structure cannot fulfill. And he fears. He does not quite know why he fears. He is living a nightmare where his impenetrable cell contains a horror he cannot see, but feels the shadow of always. It is a horror his fellow cephalopods entirely share, which is why he is quarantined to this cell. The aliens, the humans in particular, are inextricably linked to the plague that stole their world from them. And should anyone be inclined to forget, that world hangs below them, visible from any porthole and screen, writhing with remembrance. The others have gone now. He is left only with the unkind light, with few hiding places, with the aliens crouching in the next cell, all angles and muteness on the floor of their sterile, waterless chamber. Paul had hidden himself from them at first, not wanting to attract their attention because of an instinctive aversion for making things worse. He understands by now that the aliens are as helpless as he is, moreover his courage is beginning to return as the spectre of infection recedes. He would know by now if he were sick with it. And so he flicks himself into the truncated water column of his cell and gives the aliens a piece of his mind, squirming at the transparent barrier between their chambers, his skin flickering and glaring with angry colours that still contain an undercurrent of fear and bewilderment. Whilst back on his ship, he had been a volunteer diplomat, filled with mercurial temerity. All that is forgotten now, and he only knows that these ugly static creatures are the source of his discomfort. They watch him display, his colours, his skin drawn up into creases and jags, the threatening attitudes of his arms as the rest of his scattered brain does what it can to enforce his strangling desires. Then the human-looking one is holding up its device again, showing colours and shapes that are like slurred, mumbling speech. It signals peace, friendship, unhappiness, submission. That last, as close to an apology as an octopus can really make. Paul is not swayed, only emboldened, finding a victim he can truly vent his spleen on without fear of repercussion. He has never been the strongest or most charismatic of his kind, and now these aliens will hear him out, for all the good it will do. And midway through his theatrically furious display, Paul sees something recognisable and familiar happen to the human alien. It snaps. It has a temper something Paul would have said was a natural prerequisite for intelligence if he could form such an analytical thought. The human has apparently been restraining itself, an alien activity for an alien creature, but now it snaps. Its skin tone is darker, blotchy, which at least indicates some manner of internal emotional life Paul can relate to. Its mouth, is that slack hole a mouth, opens and shuts, and there is wet on its face, its awkward limbs spasm into recognisable threat postures, and it strikes the barrier between them. The colour device is often not properly angled for Paul to see it, but when he catches glimpses, the colours are very angry, very sad. It is grieving. Paul has been out of the loop, but now he realises that its fellows have died or undergone a misfortune. This is something he understands. Actually receiving meaningful communication from the alien is profoundly disconcerting. It makes Paul think of the creature as a fellow living thing, in a way he hadn't before. And can he be blamed for such prejudice? What is this creature, after all? It shows speech through a machine, and that is appropriate because everything about it is mechanical and ungainly. Its skin is dark and mute, its movements sharp and graceless, stupid as a crab or a fish, nothing of its outer show speaking of intelligence or beauty. But in the throes of its rage, overtaken by its emotions, it becomes real to Paul. The other one, the crab one, is watching, and now it begins to move, its many legs shuffling and dancing in a most uncrab-like manner. Paul understands it is trying to show attitudes, as though those jointed legs are its reach. The meaning comes through poorly, but it is plainly coordinating with its human fellow, 
and between them there is almost half a mind talking to him. He calms, feeling himself the master of this situation, less estranged from his fellow prisoners. They calm too. Such heights of emotion are alien to the aliens, they cannot sustain them like a real mind can. Paul essays a few calming colours and gestures of his own, attaching to the barrier and eyeing the pair of them. They respond in kind. The human one puts a limb against the glass, little jointed appendages splayed. The gesture is oddly familiar, almost comforting, though Paul does not consciously register it as something his arch-great creator, Senkovi, used to do. With a start, he realises they are not alone. An observer has descended stealthily into the far chamber. Feeling a curious solidarity with the aliens now, Paul unleashes a storm of angry demand towards her, leading the attention of the aliens to the newcomer. She ghosts back and forth in the observation tank, her skin strumming with muted, thoughtful colours. Something about her attitude unsettles Paul. When she descends to the console and begins making demands of the aliens, her guise seems furtive, sly. He does not receive what her reach transmits, but she is plainly someone who has a use for these aliens. She is asking questions relating to forbidden things, forbidden places, the things the humans are always linked to, and most likely the things that had brought doom to these aliens' friends. But the aliens seem eager, and Paul's ill feeling towards the newcomer intensifies. He cannot put the feeling into concrete words, but Paul's social life is one of constantly shifting factions, and there is one such faction he has never been a part of, a group that is ostracized, excised, but which never quite goes away. The octopuses eschew inflexible labels for anything, but the closest human concept might be the extreme science party. Paul feels only profound misgivings about the extreme science party, but at the same time he is in a cage and wants to be free, and if anyone will overturn the order sufficient to procure his release, it might be those anarchist heretic experimenters. He watches the newcomer closely. Two. Helena has now spent her rage and grief, and it bought her nothing, as far as she can see. Octopus interrogators have come and gone, flashed and flickered and undulated at her, and she began to hate the machines in her head that imparted meaning to any of it. Even the tenuous meaning her programs could wring from all that fluid posturing and display. Portia tried to help her as she made her futile demands. She wanted a rescue mission. She wanted a search for signals. She wanted reparations. She wanted... What she wanted was for it not to have happened, but no technology was advanced enough to grant that wish. She raged her temper into her slate, and Portia danced, following the postural cues she had picked up that formed a part of the underlanguage, the data channel. Portia's jointed body merely aped their communication, a crippled caper to their endless ballet, but it was something. She had tried to help. And now Helena sits on the floor of their cell with the slate on her knees, and Portia's forelegs stroke her leg hesitantly, trying to impart interspecial comfort. And it is not quite enough, Helena finds. It should be. She has lived amongst the Portiers all her life. They are friends and colleagues whom she understands. But it is not human contact, and before now she did not realise just how much that meant to her. The other octopus, the prisoner, had been engaged in some manner of face-off with a lone observer who had drifted in. Now it is back to goggling at Helena, but she has no more words. The currency of their discourse is emotion, and it has exhausted her. At last, Portia taps her thigh more urgently, and she looks up to see an exit iris open. Her hair twitches and lifts as invisible forces shift around her. Beyond the circular opening is blue-lit water. A pailful dashes out onto the floor of the cell in an almost contemptuous spout, as though the element is mocking her. But the rest remains contained by nothing at all. She recalls the bubble membrane the locals formed in space as the theatre for her ill-fated diplomacy. Probably the technology would be exorbitantly inefficient within a stronger gravitic pull. But here in orbit, the mollusks 
can apparently generate fields to overcome the pressure differential and the station's own weak attraction, keeping air or vacuum out and the water in. Portia approaches the portal suspiciously. If they mean we can go, they've not thought it through. But the locals are not finished. Something eye-watering is happening at the water's surface, the field deforming until a half-sphere of air dents into the water. Two or three of the cephalopods have come to watch her, and she can see, even with the unassisted eye, that their colours are striating in related patterns. Her algorithms catch up and suggest they are asking or ordering or suggesting that she go in. Neither she nor Portia like the idea much, but at the same time they have nothing to bargain with, and if their captors want to drown or crush or vivisect them, there is nothing in this solar system that could stop them. Helena wants to tell herself that the octopuses are sentient, reasoning creatures, and surely to butcher or just dispose of alien ambassadors is unthinkable. Except who knows what they might do. And shouldn't she stop relying on anthropomorphism as a yardstick of what alien minds can conceive of? The other prisoner has gone, Portia reports. Or perhaps it wasn't a prisoner. She stumps a little more and raises her front two pairs of legs at the doorway, a threat display born of pure frustration at their helplessness. We have to go, Helena decides heavily. Their hosts must know that this airy bubble is not necessary for their survival, so perhaps it indicates an attempt at hospitality. She kicks off to the iris, scrabbling at the wall to stop herself just sailing through. Portia makes a better job of it, landing neatly on the very rim, one palp extended into the cavity beyond. Hold on to me, Helena suggests. Please? She doesn't want to be separated from her one surviving crewmate, her lifelong friend. She replaces her helmet, and Portia reseals her own suit with a fussy busying of her palps. Then the spider's comforting weight transfers to Helena's shoulder and back, and Helena herself hooks the opening with two fingers and gives herself just enough forward momentum to drift in. The air bubble moves ahead of her, closing up behind, Helena's legs kicking awkwardly at the water through the membrane to keep up, sending clashing ranks of ripples across its surface that scatter the dull blue light. Within 20 meters, Helena knows she is in trouble. Life in low gravity isn't conducive to strong muscle growth, even with all the supplements in the world, nor has it offered many opportunities to hone her swimming technique. She has some reserves in her suit jets, but not the skill to deploy them properly. Inevitably, she loses the bubble, tumbling end over end in the water, hoping that this won't be seen as an escape attempt or a violation of some other nebulous boundary. She feels the random aggression of their hosts like an almost physical pressure. Surely anything might set them off, or nothing at all, prompting them to obliterate her. Perhaps she's already on her way to some pointless execution. Why are they like this? How can they even have survived if they are like this? Or are they loving gentleness with each other and xenophobia personified to the rest of creation? The water begins surging more swiftly, rolling them over and over until they are hurtling through a windowless pipe, conveyed from here to there by impatient, absent masters, then slowing, the water pressure building ahead of them to shunt them to a stop so they can be decanted almost gently into a bubble barely large enough for the pair of them, one with hard, clear walls of plastic. We're still in quarantine. Behind her, the pipe itself is sealed, withdrawing, no doubt to be sterilized. We are still infected in their eyes, or they won't risk the possibility. Helena tries to right herself, but the air pocket has not come with them, and in the water she has no sense of up or down. Their little capsule hangs unsupported in a great spherical chamber, and a hundred cephalopods drift on every side, or else cling to crooked spires and pillars that jut from the walls. Portia is scratching at her shoulder, dragging her attention round to their one reference point. One third of the chamber is window, a vast curved expanse that gives out onto the stars, onto other fragments of sun-touched detritus, onto chains and conglomerations of crystal-walled orbs rotating about each other, like a maniac's orrery collection, strung out as far as her human eyes can discern. Oh, she says, staring. For a moment the sight banishes everything else, her loss, 
her captors. If only she could put into words the wonder of it, what colours might her slate speak to the watching throng? But she is mute, and the moment passes. Talking to us? Portia cannot communicate freely in the water without a surface to stand on. She laboriously inputs messages with her palps, letting her implants translate. Helena glances from her round, reflective eyes to the drifting, squabbling host all around them. There is a lot of talk going on between the octopuses, certainly, but she isn't sure if any of it is directed at them. They just talk, or perhaps they just feel, and the feelings become speech without truly being pinned down into meaning. Helena, the linguist, is almost in tears with frustration. We had it so easy, with Kern and the Portiards. We never knew. Still, she is a scholar by vocation. She engages her software, trying to draw patterns from the crowd around her, like sifting meaningful sentences from a thousand people all clamoring at the top of their lungs. Factions, Portia offers, still clinging to her back and with the advantage of being able to watch several sides at once. Fluid. Helena nods, too busy parsing information to reply. The octopuses are divided, but the members of any given party change constantly, winning adherence one moment, hemorrhaging support the next, and yet still continuing forwards, even though over the course of 20 minutes, a given faction might undergo a complete change of shift, with none of its original members remaining, and yet its argument, whatever that was, carried forward by whichever individuals now comprise it. We're watching memes fight. There is an old earth phrase Kern used sometimes, about a boat whose every part was replaced, and was it the same boat then? Kern probably feels the philosophical lash of that particular dilemma more than most, but here is an entire society that exuberantly embraces the idea, or so it seems to Helena. Beyond that, though, it isn't hard to see that most of the points of view being expressed around her are angry, full of ugly colours, reds, purples, the white of fear, by far the most readily translatable sentiments she has come across. Likewise, that she and Portia are the target. So, treat that as the background, she tells herself, and configures her headwear to do just that. What else is there? Portia is ahead of her, or perhaps she is better at sifting patterns from the chaos. Some of them are quieter. Digitally quieter, obviously, but she flags up little clicks for Helena's benefit, subsystems of different colours moving through the busy throng like veins. When individuals meet, there might be a sudden exchange of grappling or a flicker of complex colours, but they are turned inwards, and many seem to be displaying the angry colours right up until such meetings, then donning them again immediately afterwards. Like a fifth column, she thinks. And that, of course, raises a whole other level of linguistic difficulty, because it suggests these colours can be feigned at need. And does that mean they fake the emotions behind them? Or... Helena feels her brain ready to snap. No more revelations. Let me get to grips with what I've got. The universe is not about to oblige her. She hadn't realised that her surroundings were rotating. However, just as she feels she can take nothing more aboard without sinking, the planet begins to sail ponderously into view below slash above slash before her, its leading edge steadily eclipsing the great window. The furious displays of the octopuses seem to calm somewhat, or perhaps become more uniform. All of them are scared. All of them are filled with revulsion. Any subtleties of mood or communication show only as a flickering about the edges of their mantles. Subscreens begin to spring up, spreading like puddles across the concave surface from points around the window, showing her magnified views of the world below. And she understands that this is some intentional drama they are staging for her. She is being shown something so that they can see how she might react, but not in her cell, not in laboratory conditions. They want to make this a grand opera for her, the fifth act to the tragedy. The world below is mottled, its oceans streaked and muddied and slicked over with dark, oily colours. In many of the sub-windows, she has a clear view of the surface, tides rolling endlessly, frothy with organic residue, seething with... life? Something moves down there, certainly. There is a frenetic motion at the edge of each wave, 
as though the very sea foam is animate. And then other windows show her larger things, vast, unformed, like the decaying carcasses of leviathans. She tries to understand the scale from the size of the waves, relying on the constancy of liquid physics. Thoughts of huge sea beasts become thoughts of islands, archipelagos, land masses. She watches a colossal mudflat writhe and quiver and reach up towards her vantage point with tentacles and limbs that dissolve back into slime even as they form. Then, just for a moment, there is something of a face. A human face, or perhaps several. But the features blur and blend. She sees lips gape, the half-made visage trying to vomit forth meaning before collapsing back into formless nothing. Portia has been calculating and sends her over an estimate of scale. Four kilometers from chin to forehead, unless there is something wrong with the waves. And of course there is something wrong with the waves. There is something wrong with all of it. The world has been overtaken by a churning pandemic that needs nothing but itself. That is what they feared. That is what came from the other world. That is what her fellows had gone to find, and why the octopuses, or some of them, some proactive faction of wardens, destroyed them. In that moment, she can only nod numbly along with the sentiment. Three. Fabian has been in a fugue state. It happens to both genders, although the Portiids still tacitly consider it a male condition, despite centuries of social change. There was a great deal of heat, which the spiders cannot shift as quickly as mammals. There was a lot of noise and movement that came to him like the thundering voice of a god. There was fear. Altogether, the sensory load simply overwhelmed his sense of self, and he ceased to be Fabian for a while. Some fuging portiids run around like mad things, but Fabian feels that he has been frozen still, clinging to a wall that is now a ceiling. They are down. He cannot process what that means quite yet. He feels the fugue hovering nearby, waiting for its moment. It is enough to enjoy the comparative quiet. Enough to consider that there is a slightly uncomfortable amount of gravity that has the distinctive savour of the real thing and not its rotational stepsister. None of that makes sense, but he holds off on too much analysis in case he turns up answers he won't like. Not that, he considers, any answers to be had are likely to be amiable in any way. Meshna, he sends out, finding that he can access the ship's comms channels. He has no sense of Kern, meaning nothing he has to say would mean anything to his human confederate. And of course, Meshna isn't there. Meshna went into the orbiting station. Meshna is gone. The fugue leaps on him. Fabian hasn't had an attack for many years before this, but when he was a molt or two off full adulthood, he suffered greatly from the fits. Back in the old days, that would have been a death sentence for a male, either killed out of annoyance or for sport, or starving because he could not be useful in the way males were supposed to be. Nowadays, the times are more enlightened. A little handicap is recognized as nothing more than that, even in a male. And he fights it off this time. He goes straight through it and out the other side, because to forget Fabian, comforting though that might be, would be to forget Meshna, and that would be poor service to his colleague and experimental subject. He's already wondering if there might possibly be a way to retrieve the implant. Cold, he knows, but science? He builds on that, slowly re-establishing his understanding of what has happened. The fugue has several more goes at him because, as suspected, nothing he works out is remotely encouraging. The crew section of the Lightfoot is considerably rounder than it was, its walls buttressed. He recognizes this from drills back over Kern's world. Their chamber has been made an emergency capsule, the walls thickened to become strong but yielding and flexible, able to cushion impacts and shed heat. What remains of the rest of the ship is unknown so far. He is not finding Kerm on his personal comms menu, and he is not sure how to engage damage control without the computer. It is possible that this capsule, containing two portiids, is all that is left. The light is bluish, drawn from chemicals mingled from reservoirs broken when the chamber reconfigured into its emergency state. Possibly there is no power, which means that the continued congeniality of the air is going to be a problem. 
Viola is present, bandaging herself, mostly ignoring him, even though it's literally just the two of them. Two of her legs are broken, left, three, and four, and she is sealing the breaches in her exoskeleton before her internal structure loses too much fluid. Fabian feels a keen need inside himself to ask her what has happened and what must be done, which he irritably rejects as the result of a lifetime of social conditioning. That irritability competes him, makes him fully Fabian again, and he takes stock. They were attacked, and the Lightfoot's defensive measures were inadequate to protect them from a long-range barrage that hit them almost on the heels of the first warning they had of it. This raises some uncomfortable implications, including 1. The locals were able to analyze Kern's evasion and detection ability from the first clash and neutralize it. 2. The locals could effectively have destroyed the Lightfoot at any time after becoming aware of it, and at any distance, and perhaps only their bizarre factionalism left the action so long. On the other hand, Fabian and Viola, at least, remain very much alive. Fabian marks that up as a substantial plus. On the other, other hand, they are evidently no longer space-bound. In fact, the only place they can reasonably be is on the surface of the planet they were formerly orbiting. And Fabian now knows a remarkable amount about the biology of this alien world. What he also knows, although he has no explicable mechanism for it, is that something on this world has the ability to infect Earth-born life. We remain in Violet, Viola states, without turning her major eyes on him or pausing in her patient medical attention. Fabian deduces that his feet had been betraying his thoughts. Again, he will not simply ask for orders or reassurance. Instead, he tries to coax anything at all out of the panels and consoles, despite the universal lack of power. He feels Viola's disdain through the prickling hairs of his abdomen, but then has a flash of triumph as the ship thrums about them and minimalist readouts sprout dimly on some of the screens. Did I do that? He wonders, briefly taken by his own capability, followed by the resignation of, no, it's Kern. For a long, yawning moment, there is no more, as though this fragment of the brilliant mind of Dr. Avrana Kern has been reduced to nothing but dumb numbers, but then she speaks to them, directly into their individual comms. To the portiered senses, Kern's voice can be a fantastically rich and expressive thing. She has been talking to them for far longer than she ever spoke to her own kind. That right now it is shorn of qualifiers, a mere transmission of information. She is either damaged or occupied in dealing with damage. Yes, crew section intact, quarantine section located, reports damaged. Power minimal, but under restoration. Life support adequate, but under restoration. External comms minimal, but under restoration. Motive ability, none. Fabrication ability, none, but investigating. Fabian and Viola look sidelong at each other, something they are uniquely designed to do. Quarantine section? He asks timidly, because last he checked, the Lightfoot didn't have one. Zayne, Viola states. She hobbles forward, no jumping for this spider for the foreseeable future until she can get some prosthetics manufactured. And she's right, of course. Zayn got back to the ship, unlike poor Meshner. But she was put into quarantine for fear of airborne particles of whatever that was on her suit. She had been undergoing, or about to undergo, decontamination when the attack hit. Quarantine section reports dwindling power and danger of structural integrity loss. Zayn Alpash Vanix alive. Request received for replacement environment suit and retrieval. Artifabian unit not detected. No other mechanical units available. Artifabian was, of course, in the quarantine section as well, and that Kern cannot link to it does not bode well for Fabian's research assistant. Viola is eyeing him, though, and he is aware that she has currently excused the traditional bold and venturesome female's role. Not that she would likely have taken the chance to prove her valour in his assessment. Viola is neither bold nor venturesome by temperament, and in the old days she would have had males scuttling about to perform her every whim, especially anything that involved the expenditure of energy or the assumption of risk. Or so his bitter thoughts run now, as he dons the cumbersome all-over-hazard suit Viola finds for him. Most portiered environment suits just focus on those parts of the exoskeleton that give ingress to the innards, but Fabian is more than happy to deny the hostile biosphere outside any access to him. By using up most of the energy she has accumulated, Kern reforms a hull section into a cramped airlock and lets him in, and then out the other side. He checks the readouts. Yes, 
probably there will be sufficient power for the reverse transition. Yes, probably the atmosphere scrubbers and generators will be able to keep up with attrition if they have to traipse in and out a few times. Probably. Kern is being frighteningly vague on topics where Fabian would prefer a computer to be rigorous and exacting. Higher functions restoration? He asks, none too tactfully. I'm very well, thank you. Kern's reply is acid, a decided taste of her usual manner, and therefore infinitely reassuring. I'm working on keeping you all alive. By all means continue to distract me from that. Fabian goes outside. The readouts from his hazard suit, which has its own power and seems almost painfully cheery in its enthusiastic reporting compared to Dur, wounded Kern, tell him that the atmosphere is thin and oxygen deficient. A bigger problem to Fabian than to a human, but he has no intention of breathing it anyway. And he attributes this at least in part to altitude, because the Lightfoot's remnants have come down on a mountainous altiplano, and in one direction the ground simply shears away to distant hazy valleys. He sends a brief description back, and Kern informs him, I selected a landing spot that seemed isolated and was also remote from the location of the earlier human colony on this planet, in the hope that the threat they faced was local. Her use of the concept landing is reassuring. Within a half kilometer, there is a slumped mess of hull material, partially unspooled into great drifts of filaments, which is the quarantine section. It plainly must have come down attached to the rest of the ship to be so close, either broken loose or intentionally jettisoned on impact. Fabian gives the intervening ground a careful look, because this high plane is not devoid of life. The ground is stippled with hollows, and each hollow holds something like an upturned, nine-legged starfish, or perhaps a leathery flower. The face it presents to the wan sunlight is so uniformly black that it gives the impression of a hole into the darkness of space. The sides and underside, where the tendrils have curled up slightly, are dust orange and rugged. They move very slightly, canting and flexing in extreme slow motion to make the most of the light. Between the hollows, there are groups of far smaller specimens, which Fabian decides are juveniles, but which might be vagabond males seeking mates, or hive drones serving their sessile queens for all he truly knows. These little stars inch across the bare rock at a pace a slug would scoff at. Fabian does not fancy the trip at all, but a moment later he is skittering madly for the quarantine section, vaulting high over any living thing in his way. When he is almost at his target, a shadow ghosts over him, and he quails, his upper eyes registering a long, trailing thing like a kite left to its own recognizance, rippling through the sky above. He guesses it is about twenty meters long, more than enough to make a meal of any portiered or human, should it be so inclined. Like the starfish, though, it pays him no heed at all, and perhaps its upper side is also a solar collector, and it lives an endless, mindless round of sunbathing following noon about the planet's circumference. Or perhaps not. He had believed himself fairly knowledgeable about the local biology before setting foot on the surface, given the recorded research diaries of Lanity, but there is a world of difference between hearing a scientist's analyses of protein formation and cellular structure, and standing on an alien world, viewing its alien denizens with his own eyes. It comes to him, as he reaches the quarantine pod, that this, this, is the understanding he will bequeath to his species, should he survive. He is the first portier to be here, to see these things. His scientific genius may be lost, but this moment of fear and wonder will survive. If he had considered that ahead of time, he would have been thinking brave and creditable thoughts throughout, instead of the panicky twitching he has given free rein to. He finds an access to the pod, but he needs to know the conditions inside. Hopefully, Zayin has been told to expect him. He links to the internal comms. Arrived. Your situation? Do you have suit? He does, of course, and confirms it. We'll open small lock, comes the next message. No power for more. Put suit in. Wait. He is receiving untranslated, portiered communication, he realizes, which seems precocious for Zayin, but the instructions are sound, and he follows them. Suit applied, ready, we are coming out. Fabian skitters back a little because he is not sure who or what he is talking to right now. Is it Kern? It doesn't sound enough like her to inspire confidence. 
and then the wall of the quarantine section is unseamed, and just before it becomes obvious, he works it out. Artifabian. But an Artifabian that is not linking properly to his comms, but operating the manual transmitter in the down section. Then the slit wall bulges, and a suited figure slumps out. Zayin, but plainly not conscious or well. Fabian finds human injuries hard to analyze, even without a suit in the way. They are so fleshy and unfinished, with all their organs trapped between their hard skeletons and the hazards of the outside world. How is she? He taps out for Artifabian, and the robot responds exactly as another male portiered might, body language and all. We were both harmed in the landing. She lives but has sustained injury. We must get her more substantial help. Despite the medical emergency, Fabian is fascinated. The robot stands there just like the thing it feigns, moving its palps in a repeated idling pattern, because being too still is, for the portiers, a stance filled with emotional meaning, either predator or prey. Casual fidgeting is their smiling and nodding, a low-level reinforcement of their often fraught social contracts. And obviously, simulating a portier is the point of Kern's experiment with Artifabian. But it appears to have forgotten to simulate Kern. Its casing is dented in many places, and one leg is askew, but there's plainly been some deeper damage with unexpected results. The scientist in Fabian twitches to study, but they have other priorities. Two portiers might just be able to move a human, but not over rough ground in such a way as to maintain anyone's suit integrity. Thankfully, this problem solves itself, as a tracked drone approaches them from the main body of the crashed ship, which now resembles little more than a gigantic, half-deflated tent. The drone's tracks are unkind to those starfish things they grind over, leaving a dark, leaking eye-core in its wake. But it has a flatbed that they can at least lever Zayin's torso onto, and by unspoken agreement they fold her arms over her chest and each take a leg the whole endeavour having the sense of some horrifying farce. Halfway to the main body of the Lightfoot, now not worthy of that name, Fabian discovers that, of course, the Plateau ecosystem is not a monoculture, because something has come to investigate. It moves swiftly, certainly in contrast with the starfish. It comes into view from the cliff edge, having scaled the side, or perhaps arisen from its roost there. It is... Fabian has no ready comparison. It has a globular body and a number of limbs which appear pneumatic, so that it progresses in lurching fits, the limbs at its rear inflating and thrusting it forwards, then a pause as it works out where it has gone, then another sudden charge. The starfish things are reacting to it, their limbs curling up with painful slowness, hiding their photosynthetic vulnerables from what is apparently a predator. Fabian has frozen. Now he is dragged on as the tracked drone continues its progress. The predator obviously registers their movement, Fabian is unsure if it sees exactly, and flails over, its limbs plunging rigid flaccid, rigid flaccid to bounce and jar it towards them. It is a fair match for Fabian in size, which is to say its body is smaller than a human head, and the greatest span of its limbs fully extended would be about a metre and a half. Fabian does the only thing he can think of, and gives the alien monster a full-on threat display, limbs raised high to make himself as big as he can be, palps quivering as he dances back and forth. The alien thing comes to a sudden slapping halt, and Fabian sees that there are halls and pits studied about its body that presumably serve as sense organs. It waves some half-tumescent tentacles at him uncertainly, this space-suited arachnid visitor from another world. He pitches himself even higher, almost toppling over with his tiny ferocity. And miraculously, the thing seems to get the message, and shrugs off somewhat sullenly to go and molest one of the ruptured starfish. When they get to the airlock of the Lightfoot, and Viola begins the complex logistics of preserving quarantine whilst getting everyone safe and inside, Fabian glances back and sees half a dozen of the rubbery things feeding on those starfish that have not curled in on themselves in time and also an entirely different beast, as much like an ambulatory pineapple as anything. None of them pay any attention to their visitors from the sky. Zayin safely handed off, Fabian decides to take better stock of their surroundings, because the Lightfoot is plainly not going anywhere soon. He keeps loose tabs via comms on the situation inside. 
Zayin has been unsuited and placed in a sealed section with Osh Fabian, which is now coordinating with some of Kern's attention to treat her injuries as best it can, while steadfastly refusing or unable to link to its mother computer. Kern's own resources are diverted elsewhere. Presumably she does not have the energy or focus to try and hack the robot and bring it back into the fold, and so must let it continue to patter about, lost in its own cover identity as a male portiered. Fabian scuttles around the crashed ship's edge, stepping fastidiously over great spools of unstrung hull material. The ground rises sharply on the side away from the cliff edge. He is thinking about caves, and perhaps large things that might live in caves. The terrain that way is very rugged, thrown up into blocks and jags by some hopefully distant volcanism. Or perhaps not volcanism. Fabian tries to adjust to what he's looking at, but then Kern has an announcement. I have a long-range comms contact. With the octopuses? Viola demands, because the locals have demonstrated a wide range of possible responses, and coming over to finish the job is certainly in the running. I have drones still in orbit. I have configured one as a receiver and relay station. I will be able to send out a signal that can reach the Voyager, Kern states, with more animation than before, drawing back her scattered resources from their many errands. Also, I have established contact with the station. We do not want contact with the station, Viola decides emphatically. We do, Kern says forcefully. I have made contact with Meshna. Fabian twitches at the thought, because he is not sure that there is a Meshna left to make contact with. But there might be something wearing his face up there, and the idea is almost as upsetting to him as it would be to a human. He gathers himself to give everyone the benefit of his sure-to-be-disregarded opinion, then his limbs go still, and he stares, finally processing what he's looking at. Portiids, like humans, are very good at finding patterns, even when there are none to be found. As a scientist, Fabian has tried to train himself out of such behavior, which is less the mother of inspiration than of false positives. It has taken him too long, therefore, to accept that what he's seeing is no freak of geology after all. Moments later, Fabian gets through the airlock and bursts into the crew chamber, unsuited, legs flying in a blur as he tries to get his news out. Outside, upslope, there, his feet stammer to Viola, and then with more control. There is a city. Four. Helena and Portia have been returned to their cell, but without any sense of a decision being arrived at amongst their captors more anthropomorphism. She had looked for a comprehensible narrative in the patterns of their skins and motions, a sense that their parliament was moving, through that visible debate, to some manner of rational conclusion. But then she realized that even humans, even portiers, might not present such an ordered picture in their decision-making. Even a single individual might not. What is a decision, after all? Helena knows the research better than most, there are portiered scientists who say that the mind is like an ant's nest. Individual neurons, like ant workers, weighing in on either side of any given issue until a tipping point is reached, and the brain, or the colony, thinks, I have made a decision, and here, post facto, are my rational reasons. Looked at in such a light, this civilization of the octopus is perhaps not so different to her own say that instead of the self-deceit of human portiered determinism, they're comfortable with their own malleability. Too neat? Too pithy? The physically malleable beings? And again, the anthropomorphism. In the end, she cannot escape it, part of what makes her human. She wonders if their hosts view their angular prisoners with, what, cephalopodomorphism? And pity them their lack of expression, maybe? And now Helena is honest enough to know that her mind is just spinning wheels to nowhere. The octopus prisoner apparently fared better than they, or worse, for its adjoining chamber is vacant. Or is it just hiding there, camouflaged beyond my ability to see? Almost comically soon, before either of them have done more than start to doff their suits, they are being invited to move again. The same bubble, the same pipes, but now they end up in a far smaller chamber air-filled and equipped with a recognizable Old Empire terminal, save that it is plainly newly minted and somewhat cobbled together, as though the octopuses have tried earnestly to replicate a thing known only from old records. There are things like chairs, too, 
in that they have the right general shape that are impossible to sit on without a constant fight for balance. There is... There is a picture emblazoned on one wall. It is desperately trying to be an illustration of a human, for a human. Possibly it is intended to be Dizrasenkovi, a positive human role model acting as the bridge between two very different species. A long-gone art critic might describe the end result as cubist, as though the creator was trying to show the man from multiple sides and at multiple times, all in one still image. There are a dozen octopuses at least watching them from a neighbouring chamber, most of them hovering over the rubbery, organic interfaces they use. One is front and centre, its skin paler than the others, red tones bickering about the lower edge of its mantle. Unease. Fear. That is the prisoner one, comes Portia's translated speech. You sure? Mostly sure. Or it is one that has adopted that one's... mental state? Ideas? But I think it is that one. The others are all together in some thought state or agreement. It is not. And they want it to talk to us. This does indeed seem to be the case from the front and center placement of the mournful looking creature. And why single one out for the honor, unless it has a smidgen more experience of talking to aliens than the rest as their much abused ambassador. It has a few tentacles on one of the consoles now manipulating it desultorily as colours begin to build sullenly across its skin. The initial impression is of disinterest, but then Helena reinterprets the pose as one that will let the creature jet away in retreat if threatened, mentally reassuring for it perhaps. And then the translation comes in, such as it is, and she watches with fascination as the other octopuses prompt and chatter and fight each other, or the ambassador, and then the ambassador's skin and arms speak to her, with messages that seem entirely different to what it is being told to say, save that none of the others raise any apparent objections, seeming satisfied, and she replies. Her slate links easily enough to the console. She has mastered the two-channel comms now, her words translated into colours and data, stripped of half the meanings she tries to put into them but still getting something comprehensible over. Portia watches her carefully and adds physical motion, not trying to mimic the boneless fluidity of their hosts, but adopting stylized poses, legs twisted into painful-looking positions, as she emphasizes and reinforces Helena's message. It would all, she knows, look utterly hilarious to Dizra Senkabi, who had been a man fond of his jokes when his mood was on the manic end. Then the humor is gone, because the octopus ambassador is telling her they know about the Voyager. Its visual display is merely one of somewhat arch demonstration, we know things, but the data channel has exacting telemetry on where the ship lurks in the outer solar system, up to and including potential targeting solutions. It's a threat, Portia says flatly. But Helena strives to strip all anthropocentric thinking away and decides, not yet it's not, but they want us to know they know, or perhaps they'd have to make a special effort not to tell us. They seem to communicate so much, all the time, but they know. She manages to phrase her reply to the ambassador carefully. She is proud of the Voyager, which was an admirable creation. She wonders what they want. She is calm, so very calm. She is agitated about the fate of her friends. She is curious, she is friendly. All in a sentence, all in a sentiment. She watches the audience. Not the fearful ambassador, but the rest of them, seeing shades of her words ghost across their skins, passed from one to another. Seeing a full half dozen of them erupt into furious grappling, then break apart and retreat from one another, trying to pretend it never happened, ignoring their fellows for their consoles. Their thoughts flicker about the edge of her notice as the ambassador dances again. They are speaking about the Lightfoot and its destruction, but she only knows that from the data. The emotional overtones are complex, interweaving. They are sad. They are angry. They are eager. Eager to destroy more alien visitors? No, this is an old eagerness, one they have held for a long time, nurtured with fondness, defended. She feels as though she has been given whole reams of history, the pages loose and shuffled. Suddenly they are all of a mind, colours synced, save for the ambassador whose careful messaging is a step behind and simplified, dumbed down for the stupid aliens. This is their obsession, and it is inextricably linked to the other planet. No, to the station orbiting the other planet. The one where something happened to Meshna. The one that proved fatal for the Lightfoot. 
except they have a signal, Portia confirms, quicker than Helena to decode the data channel from the Lightfoot. It is on the planet, but Khan is signaling. I suspect she's hoping the Voyager will intercept and mount a rescue mission. She's trying to keep the Voyager's location secret, though, and just broadcasting wide. I don't know if the signal will have enough integrity to be picked up that far out. On the planet, Helena echoes. Portia's palps clench confirmation, a gesture like a pained grimace. It is what it is. And then the ambassador is talking again, and she feels its colours and motions are more deliberate, an active attempt to speak slowly and patiently to the idiot aliens to get over some piece of information, some proposal. A journey, it telegraphs painstakingly, because the idea of travel is an emotion to them. Weighing of risk, fear, some specific interpretation of reward that has no exact human cognate, the satisfaction of accomplishment, triumph, and the chromatic flourish that the creature gives the sentiment justifies the exclamation mark. Simultaneously, Portia has dissected the data. They want to go there, to that planet. They want us to go with them because they think we can help? Is that it? A human, to go to a human place where a human-shaped threat is lurking. Bait, distraction, sacrifice, good luck charm, all possibilities or a rescue mission. Perhaps this is the peace faction, momentarily united in their wish to be benevolent to alien invaders from the stars. And how long might that resolution last before some other obsession takes hold over them? Enough to get to the inner planet and back again? Will they keep reinforcing each other's intentions? Or will Helena and Portia wake one morning to find the whole load of them turned into genocidal monsters? On the other hand, it is the only game in town. Five. Viola gets the drones working. Fabian is frankly surprised. He had her categorized as one of those females who didn't get her legs dirty with the practical side of things. But it was she, not Khan, who got the tracked machine out to carry Zayin, and she steered it manually because she couldn't reactivate its onboard processor. Zayin's suit is stowed in quarantine. Zayin herself, through a complex personal docking procedure, is now in the main crew compartment with the two portiers, after Artifabian confirmed that she never shared an atmosphere with the potential infection. This is not an exacting scientific standard of proof, but they are short on space in that portion of the Lightfoot that survived the crash. Viola's focus is very much the ship and its deteriorating status, as well as Zayn's injuries, but she repairs an aerial drone for Fabian to go look at this city he has alleged. Kern is little help, responding to them in bare monosyllables or sentences shorn of personality. Her attention is on the comms. She is trying to send to the Voyager in such a way as will not give away the mothership's position, or that is what she says she is doing. She is also devoting some of her attention to contacting Meshna, if there is a Meshna to be contacted. She swears there is, although Fabian has seen some data and thinks she is just linked to the human's implant, which is unlikely to be chatty on its own. Saying this to Kern meets with stony silence. Fabian drags the operational drone into the airlock, seals the aperture, and then scuttles over to the control console, which is operating on minimal power. Kern is converting the upper sections of hull to be photosynthetic, using her slowly replenishing micro-crew of ants, because direct hull control is one of the many luxuries that failed to survive atmospheric insertion. Still, ported biotechnology is endlessly moddable in a pinch, up to and including Kern's own organic hardware. She is restoring herself, recovering or reinventing her personality. From the occasional sharp retorts to stop questioning her, this is proceeding apace. He has the outer airlock door open and sets the drone into wobbling flight, imagining the unsteady keening of its rotors as it lists to one side. Then it is out from the lock, rising up over the star-strewn plain turning cumbrously to see what Viola insists is a natural phenomenon. It is not a natural phenomenon. Fascinated, a little afraid, Fabian guides the shuddering drone forwards, looking down on a boxy grid of streets, of ranks of blocky structures all collapsed onto each other. A city, but a ruin. A city, moreover, built to an alien but not unfamiliar aesthetic. 
Portiates tend towards a spiral, three-dimensional urban layout, which moreover they tend to snarl up and turn into a tangled chaos as various peer houses jockey for prominence. Humans though, humans like their boxes. They like their ranks and columns and their counting from one side to the other from top to bottom. Such thinking. How do they ever create anything? And yet they created this, surely. It is a city for humans. Where entryways have survived, they are scaled for a human's huge frame, and all at ground level. And ruined, yes, and yet... Fabian's pattern recognition centers are firing, telling him what he's seeing is wrong. He guides the drone lower, repurposing old skills because he's a behavioral scientist, not a pilot, and he got rid of any relevant understanding was long ago to free up mental space for more germane knowledge, if he had only known. The buildings are... Fabian does not jump to conclusions, especially not outlandish ones. No quicker way to kill off a male's scientific career, after all. The buildings are not built. The ground would naturally rise in this direction. He can see higher ground beyond, perhaps speckled with some other species of sessile autotrophs. And he can see a cliff. And the higher ground is natural, but the cliff is not. It has been cut away. The sedimentary stone of it worn down, quarried, mined, removed like a sculptor with a statue, until all that is left is the city. These buildings were never built from the ground up. No worked stone, no bricks. They were left behind when the rest of the ground was removed. Humans do not build this way. Fabian checks himself. He knows that humans, capitalized, do not. Perhaps humans with a small age did, back in the old empire days. But he thinks not. He thinks that they were more efficient than that. But he can see that to excavate out a city like this would be far more work than simply placing stone on stone. And besides, the drone is lower now, to the level of the crumbling roofs. He should be seeing inside one of the buildings, but there is no inside. The entryway is just a front, a doorway to nothing but wind-blasted stone. The city is a ruin, and the ruin is a fake. Some long time ago, Someone came here and made a facsimile of a city, using manifestly non-optimal methods over who knows how long, for no reason Fabian can possibly imagine. Fabian's unease increases. Portiads traditionally react to the unknown with rampant curiosity, but Fabian is feeling the creeping fear of his forefathers, who lived in a world where most things would try to kill them. He checks out the drone's parameters. It can go high, he sends it high, scudding far enough that the abandoned non-city becomes a street map. The Altiplano itself just topology and relief written in late afternoon shadow. A pair of the ragged kite things below past, startling him, but paying absolutely no heed to the drone, which is not part of their world, irrelevant as Fabian himself save that they would make quite a mess if their trailing trains got caught in the rotors. He sends the drone over the plateau's edge, looking down on a vast expanse of red desert, disfigured by technicolor lakes like violent acne, where some life or inorganic process stains the water angry rainbow colors. He sees stretches of mottling, where some life form turns its darkness to drink the waning sunlight, and other regions of brown and rust orange and even green, actual green, that tell of other life. Little microbiomes around a meager resource that lets some alien thing claw life out of the interior of the hot, dusty planet's single continent. He sees another city. It is ten times larger than the mere hamlet near their crash site, another grid, or perhaps an expansion, a larger map that contains within it a copy of the smaller. The same city, ruined, false. Fabian sends the drone further watching its battery indicator tumble, but unable not to satisfy his curiosity and feed his fear. He fiddles with the drone's cameras, reconfiguring them for a longer range. Another ghost metropolis is on the horizon, on the banks of a line drawn in the sand that is a river before and after, but for as long as it runs through the city's bounds, is straight as a canal. He pattern matches what he can see of the grid. It is the same city, a human city from a dead world, here on this distant living one. Just as he is turning the drone back for the journey home, he sees movement in the streets. For many beats of his heart, that long organ extending along the dorsal line of his abdomen, he is clenched at the controls, 
the drone spinning lazily in the air. He cannot move. His mind teeters on the point of fugue again. He has seen this thing before. Or no, he has seen something that is to this as this false ruin is to the real city it must have been copied from. It does not walk as a human walks, but its shape is something of a human's shape. Fabian has no uncanny valley where humans are concerned, but even he is gripped by the awful discontinuity of it as it shuffles slowly towards the drone's vantage point. It is built of shells and pieces of nameless creatures and shards of rock and dust. Back on Kern's world, there is an insect called a caddisfly, the adults of which are brief-lived breeding machines and also delicious. The larvae are sly aquatic ambushers that hide from prey and predators alike by constructing a casing about themselves with pieces of pebble and reed. This thing has made itself a human shape in just the same way. Its progress is boneless, awkward, utterly unconvincing, but it has made itself gloves and sleeves and boots, and a helmet, because it is not just mimicking a human, but a human in an encounter suit, an old one, similar to the antique up in the station. The polished faceplate of the helm is a stone worn smooth by the hands of running water, and it tilts to stare, so that he can see the drone reflected there, just as if it were glass. Then the drone is lifting away. Only belatedly does he recognize his own handiwork, his palps on the controls. He hauls it backwards and skywards, the camera fixed on that oddly forlorn figure. It does not raise that visor, or lift a rock-gloved hand towards the retreating remote. Instead, it slumps and shifts, as though some internal structure has been abruptly removed. And then, the apparition breaks apart, individual shells and balls of detritus rolling, crawling, away into the gathering shadows. And Fabian has the drone flee, and re-watches the appalling footage, and wonders what he can even say to Viola about it. 6. Kern, Avrona Kern, formerly of the Lightfoot and now with her consciousness situated by her own estimation, somewhere between that vessel's crashed remains and her orbital telepresence, probes the live comms channels of the station carefully. The interstation looked to be purely an organic thing, but something was transmitting the xenobiology lesson which drew her here. Was the amorphous entity that attacked Meshner also the sender of that signal? Had it once been a Malante, or indeed, had there ever been such an individual? Memory pieces fall into place as her ants replenish enough for her to recover and access them. Detail level is coarse, but very shortly before the attack, Helena had been talking about the cautionary recordings the octopuses had retained. There had been a human woman named Lante. That was thousands of years ago. So, Lante had been studying the alien ecosphere and her work was recorded in the station preserved from the elder days until some random system began playing those recordings? Kern backtracks on her own logic, even as other parts of her are feeling out the electronic architecture of the station, cautious as a bomb disposal expert, while still other parts of her are trying to regenerate the systems of the Lightfoot, one such system being herself. She relegates the possibility of some errant automatic system because whatever was transmitting has reacted and changed its behavior in apparent response to her queries. A computer then, following some corrupted programming, except she had searched exhaustively for any such system and found none. Perhaps it had gone into hiding, cut off somewhere in the orbiting hulk. Perhaps not. The organic thing had been in that room, with that terminal, it had been confined to a human shape, with a console designed, roughly, for that shape. And yet it had been... ooze. Not a mollusk, not an arachnid, not a thing of Earth at all, but in any event, a thing whose closest analogue might be some kind of slime mould. More ants, more pieces, a greater breadth of thought, backup archives located and enabled. Kern is feeling more herself. Slime moulds on Earth were a common research subject. 
Scientists had studied them for centuries because of their self-organizing capability that enabled a loose mass of individual cells to act as a macro-organism, a predator even, all without any neurology whatsoever. She diverts valuable attention to access the Lemte diaries. The content is garbled, partly incomprehensible. Kern delegates part of herself to assimilate this trove of knowledge, but she is short of resources and analyzing the contradictory garbled document requires human or portiered level functioning. She is stretching herself too thin. She wants Meshner back. It is not a good use of her stretched resources. She is not acting on the instruction of her crew, who are rather more concerned about their own survival right now. Why then is she set on this path? She tells herself that solving this question is not a good use of her resources, and even as she does, she recognizes the stance as purely self-serving. Theory 1. Her artificial decision-making processes, the ones that feel to her like real decision-making processes, because that is what it is like to be this attenuated, autonomous outgrowth of the original living woman of Rana Kern, have become dangerously compromised by the experience of simulated emotion within Meshner's implant and brain, so that she is prioritizing the recovery of that facility over other more germane capabilities like long-term life support. Theory 2. Guilt. She drove Meshner to his doom because of her obsession with not only finding something like herself in the station, but experiencing that finding through the medium of Meshner's mind. Of course, guilt is not something she can actually feel right now, beyond a logical acknowledgement of her culpability. But if she could locate and retrieve Meshna, then she would be able to feel all the guilt she wanted, all the self-indulgent, cloying, marvellous guilt she just knows is out there ready to be experienced. Theory 3. Kern is damaged. She damaged herself by playing with Qualia she should have left well alone, and that has been compounded by the crash, during which she prioritised the survival of the crew over her own integrity. Repairs are underway, but right now she is not in a position to make fully informed decisions, including the decision to tell Viola of that incapacity. So, she will find Meshner, if Meshner is to be found, because it is a bad decision, and right now that is indicative of her state of repair. And then she finds him. Or she finds his implant, still alive, still riddled with those open comms vulnerabilities that made it so useful to her. It comes down to a simple calculation. If the thing that holds the station is capable of setting such a trap, then this could definitely be a trap. If Kern wants to discover the fate of Meshner, she will have to risk that trap and rely on her own ability to extricate herself or turn it back on its creator. She considers that she is not in a position to reliably make that simple calculation of risk. She goes in. Not heedlessly, she accesses the implant like a swimmer easing herself into the water with as few ripples as possible. Meshner himself would not know. She does not interface with the sensorium within, no matter how much certain parts of her are prompting her to do so. She accesses its lowest operating level, calling up status reports. Is there any activity in the implant? Is there any activity in Meshner's brain? She resends the query three times because the answer seems outside reasonable parameters. But Mesha's brain is very active indeed. The implant is working at capacity, far too busy to cause her any difficulties. In fact, it is reconfiguring itself, following its own rules, making its use of computing power more efficient so that it can spoof more sensory data to its user. That elegant little flourish of Fabian's that allows the implant to restructure its human tech electronic architecture as though it was portiered organic engineering. But what is it doing? An odd time for Meshner to be reliving his memories or accessing portiered understandings. She only has one way of finding out, and that is to access the higher level functioning of the implant and thereby become part of the madness, whatever that madness might be, when it's crowded in there. If she goes in, she will be stretching her consciousness in an arc that encompasses the downed ship, the drone and the implant lending out her meagre, scavenged processing power to become part of the greater whole. That is a trap of a whole other kind, a set of jaws she will be putting her head into of her own volition. If she cannot extricate her logic from that of the virtual environment she enters, 
for reasons of, for example, deep and enduring damage to her own decision-making processes, then she will be dooming Fabian, Viola and Zayne as well as herself. And there may not be anything of Meshna to save. The activity she is witnessing, for all it has the shape of meaning, might just be a storm of defective synapses, natural and artificial. It might just be screaming. But she is a Varana Khan, and one part of her that is very much intact, front and center, is her sense of her own ability to master any situation. Those safeguards and gatekeepers that should have tempered this faith in herself are offline. And so she does what an Avrana Khan does in the circumstances. She takes charge. She goes in. Seven. Maybe they want you as a live host for it, Portia suggests starkly. Helena shudders, but at the same time that doesn't feel right, and she has come to the very unscientific conclusion that gut feelings about the octopuses and their intentions are a good yardstick. So much of their communication is just gut feelings, after all, modified by sporadic data on the subchannel, as though a wildly invested artist is jabbering about a new project, while in her other ear, an accountant dryly intones just how much it will cost. What her gut feeling tells her is that the octopus faction she is addressing, in the person of whichever of its members feel most engaged with the idea at the time, is after something different. An entire section of their conversation seems to have no relevance to anything else, but they are enormously excited about it. Helena sees clashing rainbow shades she never marked in any of them before. And then the data comes in, the complex strands of numbers, equations in formats that Helena's headwear and slate together cannot even display properly. It looks like... Portia turns the slate in her palps, the figures reflecting in her huge main eyes. Numbers, she finishes, annoyed at her own limitations, her lack of control. Deep physics. Whatever it is, the locals, these locals, are very keen on it, and Helena decides it is the point of what they are after that everything else is just serendipity or complication. She and Portia have already agreed to go. The only thing delaying the departure has been the garrulousness of the locals, their insistence in explaining in great detail things that their guests are not emotionally, linguistically, or just plain intellectually able to appreciate. Only the enthusiasm comes through, and that is weirdly relatable, almost endearing. Helena had been like that about her portiered translation project, trying to get out a thousand-word concept into a hundred-word pitch for her academic superiors. They care, she decides. Whatever they're about, they care deeply in the moment that they're about it. And then the next moment they might not care at all, or care about some other thing, but the threads of the things they're invested in go on and come back to them. All that factional shifting, but she feels that individual priorities just ebb and flow like tides within them rather than being swept away. Soon after that, and little the wiser, they are aboard a ship. The ship itself is smaller and more elaborately shaped than the enormous spheres the Octopus Space Navy apparently favours. This one is four globes, ranged from large to small in a tapering chain, each one fitted with a separate set of what Helena thinks are probably drives rather than weapons. And why? Does it separate? Every sphere its own escape capsule? She hopes she won't have to find out. The penultimate sphere has obviously been the subject of recent cephalopod engineering, however, because it is full of air. She had wondered about the logistics. The octopuses are water creatures suspended in a watery medium, cushioned against any stresses of acceleration. But Helena knows enough physics to worry about the airy cavities in her body, and what precisely would happen if the dense medium around her underwent a sudden change of pressure as she hung unprotected within it. The solution, according to her hosts, is a small sphere lined with some manner of transparent gel, presumably to serve as a cushion against acceleration, although Helena determines she will keep her suit and helmet on at all times to avoid getting mired and ending up smothered in the walls. There is nothing else, none of the clutter the locals evidently like, their bars and posts to cling to. The whole thing looks far more like a prison cell than anything she has been a tenant of so far. From the inside, she can still see blurrily out in all directions. 
On board the forward section of the vessel, a handful of octopuses are either performing vital pre-flight checks or just attacking the control consoles in fits of pique. Much of her view is blocked by the internal architecture which fills the center of many of the spheres, making tiny planetoids of rugged seafloor for the crew to crawl about on or hide within. The technology is far from anything human hands might design. She can recognize almost none of its function. Beyond the walls of the ship, in the greater hangar space beyond, she can see more of the locals, and her translation software begins to tell her belatedly that all is not well. She had fallen into the trap of thinking that she was dealing with a united civilization, hierarchically organized and capable of being treated as a single entity. Whether that could ever be a possibility is a point for the historians and sociologists, but in this solar system it is actively excluded by the nature of the inhabitants. The cephalopods gathering outside are looking angrier and angrier, and the movements of the crew are definitely more hurried, their moods visibly lightening with worry. It comes to Helena that she and Portia might not have been released from prison so much as stolen, and this whole mission might be going counter to the wishes of the collective zeitgeist, insofar as this culture even has one. Just as she thinks there might be an actual angry mob gathering, everything beyond her curved wall falls away, a sudden force pushing her elbow deep into the gel. By the time she has righted herself and assisted Portia, they are clear of the world-like bulk of the orbital globe that held them, spat out across the great roiled surface of the watery world and accelerating fast enough to keep them glued to the back of their compartment. The tormented face of the planet whips past beneath them for the first hours of the journey, a merciful blur shrouded in cloud. Then they have completed their slingshot and are casting off into the great dark, all their engines still on full burn. Portia is feeding her data gleaned from the octopus transmissions as best she can under the crush of acceleration. They are devouring all their fuel, exhausting reserves, soon to be on a one-way trip to nowhere at all in a piece of utter rocket science lunacy. And the droids do not let up, keeping to their remorseless acceleration, getting them rapidly clear of the large and lumbering ships that might decide to come after them. Helena, a prisoner both of mollusks and physics, can do absolutely nothing but fight to keep breathing as the force of their escape pummels her. Just as she feels she must pass out, she catches sight of something else out there, ludicrously close, at first behind them, then coasting alongside. It is another vessel of the same general design as theirs, three more linked bubbles but considerably larger and already kipping along. She can see their drives burning, but the bigger ship's acceleration, as fed to her by Portia's stolen figures, is less than their own, so that they have caught up with it and Helena understands that this larger vessel had been underway and gathering speed for a long time, slouching along as its engines overcame its leaden inertia. Had it been racing the Voyager or the Lightfoot, the portier vessels would be out of sight by now and already coasting to preserve fuel, hares to this tortoise. Their little string of bubbles has slung about the water planet at a precise enough trajectory and end velocity to intercept the larger science vessel. With barely a shudder or a knock, without any fanfare at all, they tag on to its endmost section, creating one long line of bubbles speeding through space. The mathematics involved beggar the imagination, especially as their little tail stub has just run out of fuel, so its end velocity precisely matches the speed of the larger ship at the very moment of meeting, and they tag on, falling into the larger vessel's rather more sedate acceleration. Helena and Portia are twisted and bruised, but the rest of the journey promises to be more comfortable. They begin to disentangle themselves from the gel. Portia studies the visible machinery and makes calculations. Hours later, the larger vessel is still burning fuel from a supply that seems, Portia believes, barely diminished, still accelerating, catching up on that notional hair in just the way a tortoise can't. The octopus crew themselves have apparently lost all interest in their air-breathing cargo, and possibly in the mission itself, and Helena can only hope that their inspiration will return to them when they near their destination. Portia has calculations for that, too, tracking the planet they had left, stealing telemetry from the vessel's unguarded systems. The projected course is an elegant curve between orbits that suggests they will be burning fuel to speed up all the way until they start burning it to slow down. Portia then tries to work out just what that says about fuel efficiency, 
and runs into the hard limits of her own knowledge. Once again, she asks the question, could we do this? And the flat out answer is no. This ship is known to its crew by an emotional moniker Helena best translates as looking at a thing from outside. A combination of detachment, curiosity, and scientific snobbery. Despite its greater mass, it will make the voyage between planets more swiftly than the Lightfoot, or anything Senkui's people could have built. In the chamber forward of their own floats the prisoner-turned-ambassador, and to Helena's eyes it isn't clear which hat the creature is currently wearing. Certainly it is alone, and it keeps one bulbous eye on the rest of its kin, and one on the two alien visitors, leaving it unclear which prospect delights it less. Its colours remain very subdued, with a constant chalky flourish strobing here and there across its hide. It is this individual that lets them know there is a problem, hours later, after she has slept and then awoken, finding herself surrounded by nothing but space and the cold, impersonal glints of stars. Portia is jabbing her, because the prisoner ambassador has gone dead white and is clinging to the spokes that jut through the centre of its chamber. Helena fumbles for her slate, trying to make sense of what is going on, and eventually just has to ask, gushing images of curiosity and anxiety towards the creature and hoping it will deign to respond. The ship's crew have left it a console, and it squirms down to it, still the colour of chalk. Its visual language is all undirected fear, elements of death and violence, Blaine turned on Portia and herself. The data channel contains more flight calculations though. Helena stares at it, willing it to make sense, but Portia, with her pilot's understandings, sees instantly. Another ship, she indicates, approaching us, hostile intent. Look, there are comms logs. Threats, probably. They couldn't have caught up with us, Helena thinks. But of course, there was already a little constellation of vessels patrolling the void between planets. This newcomer intruding on their personal space is identifying itself with a fist of bleak emotive tags she cannot immediately understand. Something of desolation, something of frustrated hunger. Nor is it alone in the wider reaches of space. There are others out there, all of the same mind, and Portia follows comms traces between them, a spider exploring a dangerous web, until she reaches the profundity of depth that swatted the Lightfoot so contemptuously. And here is one of the profundity's allies, Shell that echoes only, whose angry name denotes only death and absence as clearly as a skull would to a human. Here to make sure their rescue attempt is stillborn before it ever leaves the egg.